uh, as well. It's a collaboration between the ILO team in charge of South-South Triangle Cooperation in the department called Partnership and the team in charge of standards policy in the department of norm. And this is quite innovative because this is uh, one of uh, initiative to bring in the South-South Triangle modality when we talk about normative issues. And one of the main purposes is, is to show how a country's ratification and application record can lead to sustainable development as a comparative advantage to attract investment, trade, and development partnerships. It is also very interesting because through this workshop, we would like to see how um, the work related to promotion of trade and investment can actually lead to better application of conventions of the ILO. We hope that the exchanges that all of you will make today and tomorrow will encourage all of you to see standards under a new light as contribution to sustainable development. And for us in the office, for us in the ILO, this initiative is also quite important because we would like to hear from you how the office through collaboration with our constituents working in the Ministry of Labor, as well in the related ministry dealing with uh, trade can help us promote one of the um, one of the priority areas of work in the ILO's uh, next cycle of programming in terms of uh, promotion of international labor standards through trade relations, responsible businesses practices, and other form of partnerships. This workshop will touch upon these areas and build on them with a view to building collaborations among the participants around them. So we are actually glad to have all of you here from the three countries, because we would like to hear from you. What is your real experience in dealing with the promotion of international labor standards through the work related to the trade and investment? Which is why in one of my walk to meet all of you in this, uh, this morning, I, I'm very glad to see that not only constituents representing the Ministry of Labor, but also those representing the Ministry of Trade and Commerce. And this is also a, a novelty for the ILO because we bring in countries which are either have just graduated from the LDC or are about to graduate from the LDC. And that experience will be something that will be relevant for the work of the ILO going forward in the region because there are a lot more countries like you who are in the next three to five years will also be a candidate for LDC graduation. I would like to therefore thank all of you and looking forward for your active participation and discussion. And do let us know at the end of your workshop tomorrow, what it is that the office can help you promote ILS through work related to promotion of trade and investment. And I'm also pleased to see that the um, way of doing this workshop is quite, um, um, how should I say, different than the normal way of ILO conducting workshop. So I have to thank the team of consultant who has been hired to help us facilitate this discussion. I also like to take this opportunity to uh, thank colleagues from uh, partnership department, as well as from uh, standards department for their thoughts, uh, contribution, and participation in this workshop. So on that note, once again, good morning, welcome, and have a productive workshop. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Oktab. Um, let me see if I can get our screen back up. Yes. Okay. So this is exciting, right? This is something new. Um, second person I'd like to invite to, to share some uh, opening thoughts is Tanya Cajon, who is a senior multilateral relations officer with Partnerships in Geneva. Tanya. 
Uh, okay, it's better now. Good morning. I'm happy to be here today. It was nice meeting you online last week, but uh, I always prefer to be uh, in person with people. I think it's better to connect and to exchange. Uh, so I'm uh, very happy to be here from uh, from multilateral. Um, not multilateral, sorry. I used to be in multilaterals, but it's partnerships. It's new, so <laughs> sorry for that. Um, and uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, SST. Um, so South South and Triangular Cooperation is a complementary modality of development cooperation, which provides a steering and catalytic support to countries in the global South. South South Cooperation uh, and Triangular uh, Cooperation are two approaches that accelerate peer learning and good practices sharing. So. Uh, as mentioned by uh, the deputy director, we are here to uh, to listen to you, to learn from you, and also you were you are here to uh, uh, learning and listen from uh, each other. So there are some uh, some example of South South cooperation and triangular cooperation, uh, like the participation of workers, employers, and governments in fin financing decentralized processes. Uh, the exchanges with the Global Labour University, the promotion of ILO's normative and tripartite work, as well as um, learning about common country analysis and UN cooperation framework. Uh, the ILO, through its partnerships cooperation department, has launched uh, for the last two, three years, uh, 23 South South and Triangular cooperation projects across the five regions. Uh, SST's projects have covered 75 uh, countries and additional global activity on a wide range of topics, including employment services, women, economic empowerment, employment policy, skills, informality, occup occupational safety and health, labor migration, technical and vocational education, and training, sustainable tourism and disaster risk, as well as the promotion of international labor uh, standards. It is also important to build strategies uh, supporting their development projects in the upper world economy once they have graduated from LDC's statue. Uh, Therefore, is it uh, there is a need to strengthen the capacity of the countries to use ILS as a basis to build trade partnerships, investment incentive, and other partnerships for development for the realization of the 2030 agenda, and of course, uh, the application of ILS. So, in this regard, this is initiative on LDC, SSTC, and ILS aim to encourage strategies that link normative work with national development priorities. And there is some examples of good practices. We have talked about that uh, last week, but just to mention that, for example, Bangladesh has taken step uh, to integrate ILS ratification, labor law reform, and social dialogue into national strategy by answering in um, engaging in a dialogue with the ILO governing body and the social partners. Uh, for also, Bangladesh has ratified uh, Convention 138 last year and the Protocol on Forced Labor. Uh, similarly, in Nepal, uh, Nepal is taking steps to ratify Convention 81, 87, and 155. Uh, and Vietnam, for example, uh, where some steps taken include a five East country plan in aligning with the UN framework, the promotion of the tripartite system, collaboration with uh, international organization, and the promotion of ratification on Convention 87 on freedom of association and collective bargaining, as well as Convention 102 on social protection. Uh, so in conclusion, SST, SSTC, uh, within the framework of the ILO International Labour Organization represent a powerful tool for advancing decent work and addressing labour-related challenges on a global scale by promoting collaboration, knowledge exchange, and capacity building among countries with diverse experiences and resources. SSTC contributes to the achievement of the ILO uh, mission of social justice and decent work um, condition for all. And, um, well, 
I will stay here. And uh, just to say that I'm very happy to be here. It's my first time in Bangkok. And I must say my first time in Asia. So I'm happy to start my, uh, <laughs> my journey uh, in Asia with you today. And I'm really uh, excited to discuss with you, exchange with you, and learn from your experience. Thank you. Just <laughs> welcome, welcome, Tanya. So thanks so much. So this this workshop itself, putting it together, has been a, a collaboration, which is why we have uh, opening remarks from three people. And so one uh, a last final set of opening remarks is from Tim DeMeyer, who's a senior advisor to the director of Norms at in Geneva. Tim. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Colin. A very good morning to our delegates, representatives from tripartite, uh, delegates, representatives from uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Vietnam. It's, uh, we had the opportunity, I think, last week to get to know each other a little bit, but uh, online is never the same as, uh, as seeing people face-to-face, uh, -face. so it's good that we see this workshop materialize also because I know that uh, all the people working behind the scenes uh, here in Bangkok, uh, Geneva, Kathmandu, Dhaka, Hanoi, uh, I witnessed mostly, uh, given that it was my colleague uh, Katerina who was doing most of the preparatory uh, work, but I could, uh, I was copied on all the emails and I could see that over over the period of a year, there's an enormous amount of work that has gone into this uh, this this happening. So we're we're really really pleased. I'll be I'll be uh, short now because I think I am actually next up on the on the next uh, the next session on the the normative the normative strategies. We'll explain a little bit, uh, trying to get you into the mood, so to speak. What uh, what a normative strategy is, why it is. Um, and really what it is about, uh, I repeat what I think I said last year, what, last week, not last year, maybe I, last year I said it as well. Um, what it really is about is to think about international labor standards in a, a bit more of an innovative way, a bit more of a creative way, a bit more of a helpful way, rather than reducing international labor standards to the procedures that we all know to an extent fairly well, I think. And if that is not the case, please do not hesitate uh, to ask questions. Most of it will about process actually uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, a lot of it, a lot of your work will go into uh, process oriented work. But at the end of the day, is the substance that matter and the difference that uh, that this substance makes in the lives of people. So if you have questions on the substance with respect to the various standards that we are referring to, please do not hesitate. But what it is at the end of the day is to look at international labor standards to see how it can be helpful. And in particular in today's world, how it can be helpful towards us, as Octav was saying, um, become, okay, it's, a, it's about attracting trade and investment, but it is, also, far more importantly, trade and investment are only means. They're, it's really about making societies more stable, better governed, uh, and producing better outcomes in terms of life for uh, for the many people uh, that uh, the many millions of people that uh, that live in the countries that are represented here um, today. So, it's in that uh, perspective that I wish everyone. Um, good inspiration, and also do enjoy your time here in uh, Bangkok, particularly for those who uh, it is the first time to come here because it's uh, it's a true metropolis. It's a true um, a true city of the world in all its aspects, good and perhaps sometimes less good. Uh, do enjoy your time. Take uh, take uh, take your time to be inspired. And hopefully, hopefully, we will be able to uh, do this again, either with the same group of countries or another another pairing. This continent is very diverse. We have brought together three countries that 
perhaps not in all respects have that much in common. I think I also said that last week. Um, different histories, different legal systems, different political priorities. Uh, but as we all know, politics also come out of over time. So with all this, good inspiration, good health, and do enjoy. And um, let's get started. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tim. You know, one one of the things I was just noticing and that I love about this group is that uh, so often when we have two rows of chairs, everyone sits on the back row, right? No one wants to sit in the front. And you folks are our, our Nepal colleagues, fantastic, right? You folks sat at the front, everyone's sitting at the front. So uh, uh, thank you for that, that's fantastic. Who here was not in last week's online training? Is anyone uh, joining us uh, for the first time? Was everyone here in online? Yeah, a few of you. Okay. All right. No problem. No problem. Uh, I just want to explain a little bit about where we are, right? So where we started is back in July, we did some individual country meetings to understand what were some of the interests of, of different countries. Were there particular sectors that you were looking to grow, particular areas like social protection, for example? And then we did last week, we did this uh, uh, online training where we had an introduction to ILS and we had an introduction on gender. We had a little bit of country sharing as well. And then finally, this is where we are today, is the workshop where we're looking at what kinds of collaborations could we potentially create, right? So this is where we are in the process. There are two goals that I have for our workshop today. Number one, is we wanna create a space where we can learn from what other countries have done. So there are some countries that are already, uh, uh, have already gone through some of the challenges maybe that you're looking to address. This is an opportunity to learn and have discussions with the people from those countries. Um, there are some countries that are right now trying to solve the same problems that you're trying to solve. And we want to create an opportunity for you to work together or to learn together. Um, and so that's the second point is to identify some of those areas for mutual learning or, or joint work to leverage ILS and supervisory processes for inclusive economic development, as, as Tim was saying, to, to support the millions of lives, right, that are um, improve the millions of lives that are um, in each of our countries. Now, our workshop is in is over two days. Uh, and just to give you a sense of what we'll be covering over those two days, we've got two sharings here. So one sharing is on normative strategies. That's where we're going to start. We're going to have a presentation. And then we're going to hear some, uh, I think, sharing of uh, from different countries. And then we've got one on the gender related aspects of ILS. So originally, we wanted to do the sharing on gender related aspects in the online training. We're going to do it here today, right? Um, and then, and then finally, later on, what we're going to look at is a little bit about South-South and triangular cooperation, country goal setting. So what are some of the areas of interest for each of our countries? We'll get together to discuss that a little bit. And then we'll bring the different countries together to see what are some things that we could do together? What are some things that we can learn from each other? And we're going to do that twice, right? So we're going to do, we're going to do it today. We're going to do a second round tomorrow. Then we'll look at what are some potential actions we could take. Uh, and then we'll do closing reflections tomorrow. So that's uh, what our schedule looks like. Uh, I've got a couple of things for us to keep in mind, uh, a few things for us to keep in mind today. Um, number one is we're here to explore potential collaborations, right? So we're not making any decisions. No one is, is walking out of here uh, uh, committing necessarily to say, okay, my government will do X or Y. I know that we are not in a position to make commitments uh, today. Uh, and tomorrow. What we do want to do is we want to put some ideas on the table, right? So if we're going to go back to our own ministries, associations, whatever it is, uh, we need to have some ideas about what we could propose to them, right? And so today and tomorrow is about developing those ideas. What could it look like if we were to have a collaboration between, you know, Nepal and Vietnam and, and Bangladesh, right? What could that look like? We want to explore so that we can develop a, 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 an idea of what we could potentially propose to some of our stakeholders for doing that, right? We're not making any decisions. Two is we want to make sure that um, everyone has the uh, uh, room to be heard. So we're encouraging you all to speak up, but also to make room for other people. We want to make sure that uh, everyone has an opportunity to be heard. Um, and then lastly, I know that 
um, work is still happening for many of you, uh, that there are emails coming in and things like that. Our ask is that while we're doing the workshop today, that uh, you keep your focus on each other and on the conversations. We have good coffee breaks. Our coffee breaks are about 20 minutes, right? So it's a decent amount of time. So if you want to catch up on things, you'll have time during the coffee break. But we just ask that you give each other your full attention, right? So I want to create a bit of space. A lot of this is about uh, meeting each other, right? So what I want to you to do in a few moments is I'm going to ask you to find someone from a different country, right? You're going to find someone not from your own country, but from a different country. You're going to go see them. You're going to introduce yourself and then tell them this is about labor, right? So you're going to tell them about what was your first job, right? What was your, what was the very first job that you did, right? After school, after graduating from university, whatever it was, what was your first job? Share a story uh, uh, about that, right? So this is how we're going to meet each other this morning, is you're going to find someone from a different country, you introduce yourself, and then you share what was your first job. Understand? Any questions about this? Okay, go find someone from a different country then. We'll give you about 10 minutes to do this. This piece, we're going to come back to Tim, uh, and Tim is going to give us a, a presentation on normative approaches. And then what we're going to do is we're going to follow that up with some sharing from different countries. Um, our screen is a little bit uh, uh, temperamental, Tim, just <laughs> for so you know, uh, but it comes back uh, it, it eventually. But Tim, uh, over to you. Thank you. Uh, I'll use this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Cal, and a uh, very good morning uh, to all of you again. Um, my first job was with the uh, Ministry of Labor and Employment in, uh, in Belgium. And uh, for a number of years, I basically wrote labor law for, uh, for Belgium. But in Belgium, uh, labor law is, uh, is quite serious business because if you fall foul of some of the provisions, whether it's the employment contract law or the collective labor relations law, it can cost you a lot of money. There are law firms that uh, actually earn a lot of money with uh, with labor law, so we had to we had to get it right. And um, the advantage of it is that um, it it helped me quite a bit understand at a later point in time the importance of of international labor standards because that is then what I went on to do. In fact, I spent uh, many years in uh, this part of the world. Uh, I lived for a number of years in Bangkok and a number of years in Delhi. I was uh, actually officer in charge for a number of for a number of weeks of the uh, Dhaka office in uh, '98. Uh, it was a very, uh, very memorable, very pleasant experience. Uh, also, I liked it. I really did. So we were just sharing some, uh, some, some, some experiences with uh, Ras Malai, one of the fa very famous uh, desserts of, uh, of Bangladesh. Okay, um, this uh, introductory presentation I am making this morning on normative strategies. I could have done it in many different ways because there is no template at this point in time for doing a normative strategy. But what is uh, what I will try to do in the few minutes available is to give you an idea of what what it could be a normative strategy what it is because it's one of those terms uh, a little bit of a, maybe a reminder of what I said last year why are why are we doing this what's the, the purpose behind it and then just um, a few hints and what will be very quite central to these hints is that when you do a normative strategy, please do not only look at ratification, but look at application and look at what the supervisory bodies of the ILO, the bodies that are mandated to review the application of international labor standards, please do take a look what they have to say and do it in a way that makes sense to you because um, the ILO supervisory bodies, to put it in simple terms, they are given a particular mandate, and that is to look at the official information they have, compare it 
with what the international labor standards negotiated at the global level have to say and point out what the what the divergence is, what the gaps are. And over time, the expectation is that countries, because they have undertaken these obligations, the expectation is that countries close these gaps. Does that mean that you need to close each and every gap within 24 hours? No. And this is where this is where the strategic element comes in. Is that you need to think for yourself, given the situation we are in right now, given our history, given where we want to go, how do we, what do we take on first? And communicate that as clearly as you can to the ILO supervisory bodies. And why is that important? And here we come back to the question of trade and investment, because this is the way you communicate with the rest of the world. This is how you have an opportunity to make the rest of the world understand what it is that you are trying to do in the light of the obligations you have undertaken. So please keep that, keep that in mind. Ratification, but also application and do it in a way that makes sense to you. So if this screen is no longer temper temperamental, then let us, very good, yes. So what are normative strategies? Oh, I would have wanted this to come out a little bit uh, bigger, but that's okay. We can, uh, we can live with that. So as I said, strategies that are country specific and that seek to make international labor standards and integral parts of efforts to advance decent work and sustainable development. All of you, all of you indirectly have subscribed to the 2030 development agenda, correct? How many targets are there in the sustainable development agenda? 17. And how many of these have to do with decent work? SDG 8. Yeah, that's what everyone says. But actually, international labor standards have to do with far more than SDG 8. SDG 8 is the SDG sustained and sustainable economic growth with a view to advancing decent work and full and productive employment. Now that's SDG 8. So that's where the term the decent work appears. But if you take, take SDG 10, keeping inequality in, in check, you will see that there is an indicator somewhere there making sure that the so-called labor share does not get out of whack. That means the amount of income that a country produces and that will come to those pe to people who work as, as, as opposed to the people who have basically capital. That is something that is very important for international labor standards. Just to give you one example. So most of the SDGs, gender equality, poverty eradication, and so on, have to do or international labor standards do contribute to them. And, the, and so you need to give all of these aspects a little bit of a thought when you develop a strategy. Um, strategies that pluck blind spots amongst the decent work strategic objectives. Oof, that's, a, that's a mouthful. Um, I do assume that most of you are familiar with what the decent work strategic objectives are. And if I paraphrase it, making sure that people have a job, making sure that, that the income that is generated from that job is protected, either because health and safety is protected or because there are social security systems, making sure that people can effectively participate in the, the decisions at work that affect their lives, and respect for fundamental principles, no forced labor, freedom of association, no discrimination, no child labor, safe and healthy working environment. And the third aspect, strategies that plan over time. And this is this is now important. And you, this is important, not because of this slide. It will be the third one. And then I'll go back. Because what we are seeing now very much with um, many of our member states 
And this is a few. This is a little bit of a chart of where we see the this, the difficulties are. A lot of countries, particularly in this part of the world, Asia Pacific, are reluctant to ratify. They are reluctant to undertake obligations because they feel that if we ratify, we invite criticism. And this is what I said earlier with the supervisory bodies. The job of the supervisory bodies is to say, like, look, this is a complication you have undertaken. This is the gap. Please close it over time. But none of the supervisory bodies, except in very serious circumstances, will actually say you need to do it now. They will say it's that's it's your it's subject to your development priorities. But you should not give up on undertaking obligations because at some point in time you are going to get a, 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 a you are going to get a comment from the supervisory bodies. The function of comments are both. It is to point out the gap, but it's also by pointing out the gap to say this is possibly a, a step forward. These are areas where you possibly may want to look first in order to in order to uh, to go ahead. The other thing that we see is that ratifications, when they do come along, they're very piecemeal. Um, that means you, a lot of countries in the world, and we see that very clearly also right now, uh, the great majority of the ratifications that we are receiving from around the world are on Convention 190, violence and harassment. Why? Because it has gotten a lot of, it has gotten a lot of attention. It's the most recent standards that we have adopted. Therefore, the media, of course, are very much on it. There is, admittedly, a very significant issue with gender-based violence, not just in the world of work, but outside as well. And therefore, it attracts a lot of attention, and therefore, there is a lot of political momentum behind it, and therefore, there are a lot of ratifications by governments who say, like, well, we need to do something about it. Yes, but... We have 190 conventions. A lot of them deal with absolutely essential, um, with absolutely essential um, labor, what we call labor market institutions. Many of those, in many cases, haven't been ratified yet. So you really need to look at your at your ratification record as a whole see where the gaps are, and I go back to the strategic objectives, uh, where the gaps are in each of those four areas, and then see where possibly, and this is of course where South-South Corporation comes in, South-South, where elsewhere in the world this is gathering attention and whether there are any lessons that can be gleaned from there. Um, Reporting and application, I, I mentioned already. Please do not forget in a strategy um, these. So what you will be looking at, I'm trying to go back now. Yes. These are the aspects that you ideally in a normative strategy, the, the, just the large headings that you would need to look at. Ratification, application, engagement with the supervisory system, and that means communicate strategically also, not just saying, uh, yes, we've noted the gap and let us do something about it, but let us lay out a plan to the supervisory system to say, and this is how we are going about it, and this is what we hope to achieve within um, a particular point in time, within a particular period at least. Um, engagement with standard setting because the organization continues to set standards which is necessary because the world of work changes. We will be looking at new standards on biological hazards, protection against biological hazards in 24-25, 25-26, standards for workers in the platform economy, down the line probably also standards around ergonomics and maybe at some point access to labor justice in order to improve dispute settlement. So the, all this is down the line, what we're looking at. And it's important that you also engage with these issues uh, in your normative strategy as we go along, because the more work you do up front before the standards are set, the, the less work you have to do afterwards, the more you are prepared to consider the importance of these matters for your, 
for your own development. Connectivity with the human rights systems. That's also important. Why? Because in many cases, these are different ministries within the countries concerned. UPR, the Universal Periodic Review, is mostly reviewed by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Foreign Affairs are more political. They know less about the technical aspects of governing the world of work. But it's important that labor administrations, for example, as well as, of course, the social partners, that they have an opportunity to, to help the foreign, the, um, the foreign Affairs Ministry to understand the issues that are at, at stake. But the, the, um, the Universal Periodic Review is, of course, also um, a mechanism that has, given that it is United Nations proper, so to speak, that has a significant visibility. So a lot of the things that you are working on, you may actually want to. All of this is part of a, of a normative strategy. That's, so that's the first thing, is the what. I am, because I'm looking at the time, um, normative strategies. I spoke about that last week. So let me perhaps say a little bit less about that. Where do I need to point in order? To... Yes, okay, good. Normative strategies. Why? Because it's good for you, that's the one thing. And the other thing is, it's important for the rest of the world. Not everyone in the rest of the world pays equal attention. And this is why you do find conditionality, which I will speak about a little, the conditionality with making trade preference a subject to uh, international labor standards, you're typically going to find this with the countries that are, so to speak, high income, um, and you're less going to find it with countries that are uh, middle income, because for labor-intensive countries, for labor-intensive countries, of course, having more trade the opportunity to trade more is important because it provides employment income social stability source of hard currency infrastructure human resource development the list is endless for the high income countries they have a stake because better labor standards contribute to political stability a, a source of cheap consumption goods, let's let's be honest, that is that is certainly part of it. And an export market for more techn technologically intensive goods. But for that to materialize, of course, living standards in developing countries need to go up. Yeah? So the, the growth of a middle class in a middle income country is very important for the high income countries in order to, to be able also to benefit themselves from increased in, in, uh, exports. So that is a little bit, that's a little bit the picture. Why, um, why labor standards matter for everyone and in a trade and investment context and why um, it is good to keep that, to give that in um, the development of a normative strategy. Um, Okay, that is basically more of the same, so I'm going to skip this. Uh, in the interest of time, there's one thing that I would... Yeah, so this is a, just a quick overview of, for example, and I am here not as a representative of the European Union. Let me be that, let's make that clear. We're here to... As, I, as we said in the beginning, to see how international labor standards can be useful for you in the first place, right? But this is where, in the world in which we live, one example of where trade preferences come in, come into the picture. So, the European Union is revising its unilateral system for trade preferences according more or less according to these um 
these principles. And one of the things that you, for example, see is that for those who would like to have additional trade preferences, GSP plus, there is an additional expectation to ratify Convention 81, which deals with labor inspection, and Convention number 144, which deals with basically the bare minimum of tripartite consultations. Yeah? Now, I'm not going to, uh, to go into, into this. But what does that mean? Well, it means, for example, in terms of ratification, if you look just at this aspect of the trade preferences, for Bangladesh, not much, because all of the additional conventions, 81, 144, you've ratified, or ratified all of the fundamental conventions, is done. In Nepal, there's a bit more work to be done. Hmm? 87, and in particular, 80, 81. Yeah. So this is this is how you would look at at that sort of that sort of situation, just from this angle. And I'll very quickly in the time that rests rests. Uh, no, I have to go back here. Is that also look at application, please? Yeah. So, for example, and this is by no means exhaustive. There are comments, plenty of comments in the supervisory system, both for Bangladesh and Nepal. And I'm picking out just a few here of the fundamental standards and pick out a few of the items that you may want to look at. So if I take, for example, Nepal discrimination, the supervisory comments say that in the legislation, that legislation is still missing a definition of direct and indirect discrimination, and that it does not cover all of the prohibited grounds of discrimination that are listed in the convention. So the way you would look at it is to say like, well, maybe discrimination is not something that is up uh, in the next three years, maybe not the next five years, but we've taken note and we're at least starting to organize awareness raising, we're starting to organize workshops, we're starting to organize um, consultations internally to see what does that mean, direct and indirect discrimination? How could it be important for us? Do we really have issues in this area and how are we going to deal with them? Yeah? So if you just look at the supervisory comments, that's what it says, because it's a gap. We know in practice that indirect discrimination is the most insidious form of discrimination difficult to find but important if you want to get to create a more inclusive society okay again in the interest we can go through all of these there are questions happy um i am yes this is just to say these two slides are just to say there is a phase coming after you graduate from LDC status. And that is the next phase is that you will start with countries, with groups of countries like the EU, you will start um, developing free trade agreements. Once you get to that stage, and I'm not gonna go through it, but you'll see it, once you get to that stage, you will see all of these things coming in. The negotiators will come to you with these sorts of these sorts of things. Yeah, and this is the stage at which Vietnam is, because Vietnam has negotiated an FTA with the European Union, and it is working hard in order to see how much of that can be done within a reasonable amount of time, given the circumstances in which they are. And this is why we teamed up Vietnam with you, because they are at this stage. You see? Okay. Nothing on that. Um, there's also a thing called UN Guiding Principles. 
and under the UN Guiding Principles National Action Plans. Vietnam has a national action plan. Nepal is in the process of preparing one and Bangladesh doesn't have one yet. This is important because that is determinant for what governments can do in order to create an investment climate that is in line with the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Uh, that's all I'll say about it. But that is the, so to speak, the private, that could be the private sector chapter of your normative strategy. What is it that we need to do in order to, um, to help business be better prepared for the human rights expectations that are existing in other parts of the world? Finished. Last observation. When you have a strategy, normally you think of a baseline. You think of an objective, and you think of how you move from your baseline to an objective. So you ask yourself, what's your baseline on ratification? What's your baseline on application? And then you move. And it's that movement in between that is a key part of your, of your strategy. So baseline, process, objective. For Bangladesh, for Nepal, and for Vietnam, all three of you, and I think it is in the package that's been shared, you have so-called normative stock takings. They give you all of the details of where the, what the baseline is and the things that you can consider. Um, I don't know if you have taken a look at them. If not yet, please do that. You can find inspiration there for how to develop a normative strategy. That is it as an introduction. Thank you. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Tim. And Tim, just uh, uh, stick around for a moment. Yes. Um, you're clearly very experienced in this space. And I just wanted to know for our for the benefit of our participants, and you're not going anywhere, but during lunch or coffee break, if, if they wanted to talk to you, what are some areas that um, you might be able to bring some expertise or, or advice on? What it is about priorities. Mm -hmm. so what what do you what what do I think is priorities based on what I see happening globally? Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Did anyone have any questions for Tim? Yeah. Over here. Let me let me pass you a microphone and just introduce yourself as well. Yeah. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentations. Uh, I have like some comments and observations regarding the definitions of the discrimination in Nepal. By the way, I'm representing Nepal. I work in the Ministry of Labor, Employment and Social Security. Uh, the thing that you have mentioned in your presentations, like we have ratified convention C111, and uh, of course, yes, uh, the CA, CR have advised us that, okay, we have to like uh, make definitions more clear. Uh, <clears throat> in convention C11, they have like six criteria for the discrimination they have mentioned there. In our legislations, we, ha we have eight. We define two more criteria not to be like discriminated. And uh, there the committee has asked us to clearly mention about the political views. The, the discrimination cannot be made on the basis of the political views. In our legislations, we have the provisions of ideologies. So no discrimination can be made on the based on the ideologies. So we think it's like quite enough to cover the political, uh, political opinions. So like, that's my comment uh, for you, like uh, yep. um, that you have mentioned before. Okay, thank you. I think I think there were two. Well, thank you first of all for that uh, for that comment. Um, and I am sure that if I would have listed others, then they would also have been because each of these items can be discussed. And this is why this is actually why we're here to the, to discuss them, right? I think there were two missing, if I'm not mistaken. One was political opinion, and the other one I can't exactly remember. There was another one that is missing. Um. The idea is that these seven that are mentioned, these prohibited grounds of discrimination, the idea is that they have to be found in, um, in national legislation. You can have many more. We have countries that have 15, 20, 30 prohibited grounds of discrimination. But these seven you need to have because they deal with fundamental freedoms. 
Yeah. Now, the point that you were making saying we have ideology and we think that's enough to have political opinion. I do not read that from the comment. I did not read that from the comment. So maybe you have not communicated that yet. Maybe it could be useful that you explain exactly what you understand under ideology. But the normal rule would then be that you provide evidence of that interpretation, ideally from a court case. Yeah, because the government saying one thing is one thing, but eventually, and this is in fact a standard request for most conventions, it you're expected to show how the courts are understanding the law, not just how the governments are understanding understanding the law. So this is something that could help. So in order to make the point, if you say like, look, we have a different term in legislation, okay, fine. Um, try to give evidence from ideally a Supreme Court, Apex Court, whichever one it is. Excellent, thank you. Were there any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. We're gonna move into the country experience sharing. This is one of the things that's so wonderful about bringing this group together is that everyone has some country experiences. And our first uh, share is Laxman Sharma, who's the general secretary for the General uh, Federation of Nepalese Trade Unions, GE Font. So uh, Laxman, would you like to go ahead and share? Thank you to share my country experience, uh, this opportunity. You have already mentioned my name. I represent Gifont as General Secretary. It's trade union. Uh, saying about Nepal, all of us know that we have a small labor market of tentatively 7 million population um, in average. Our leading uh, sector, economic sectors where agriculture, tourism, and industries are there. Now, uh, agriculture is synchronizing, it's it's narrowing, and tourism is also the same. Uh, earth, earthquake, pandemic hit our tourism, uh, but mostly it was based on mountain tourism, and it is a little bit synchroni synchronized nowadays. And expanding sectors are threat, remittance, obviously it is. Uh, 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 climate change is changing our rain pattern actually, and it has a hit the agriculture sector more. So uh, leaving the uh, farms, agriculture, people are migrating abroad for the job. That, this is the case. About uh, saying ILS, we have ILO country office in Nepal, and we have uh, some ratifications already conducted, and some are in pipeline, uh, we are doing our best to ratify ahead. And about follow-ups, we have always comments on it. Uh, Follow-up on application of ratifications, ILS are not that much satisfac satisfactory. We, we workers side, we used to say like that. And uh, while uh, discussing in this uh, platform, uh, we are we are seeing uh, about uh, the expanding uh, uh, labor agenda on social protection is one of the leading agenda in our case. Uh, we can share our experiences. We have a social security act functioning. We can share our experiences maybe for our friend countries as well as we can learn from you know, better experienced countries also. Uh, similarly, in uh, migrant workers' cases, Nepal has a, a, a huge experience, uh, even trade unions, where we are doing our best to organize our migrant members in different countries even. We have uh, experience on it also. So uh, we are very much delighted to uh, share our experiences our struggles, as well as uh, the experiences owned by our friends from different countries, from Bangladesh. We can learn a lot because socioeconomic status, maybe we can say fragility is uh, nearly similar. We are familiar 
in other cases also even geographically we are very near as well as from uh, vietnam also we can learn a lot they are very well organized uh, economic sector we, we we heard and we are happy to engage here and work uh, ahead together thank you very much thank you very much um, so, and, and thanks for sharing you know, all of the different areas that you could potentially work with some of the other countries. I want to now move to Bangladesh. We have uh, Rezwar Rahman, who is a Deputy Secretary for the Ministry of Labor and Employment. Who, who am I passing the mic to? Ah, there you are. And here are your slides. You can use the podium if you want. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. So uh, we'll be talking about certain aspects that we have heard from Nepal. So we have, would uh, look into similar things from Bangladesh. Uh, firstly, we'd like to... Uh, like Bangladesh, uh, we are enjoying demographic dividend. So a large number of our population are uh, from zero to 24. So which is a positive sign of demographic dividend. We have strong migrant workers living uh, as expatriates and we have export driven manufacturing, uh, which is contributing to the economic growth. Bangladesh is also beneficiary of EBA, presently that we have been enjoying from European Union, which is contributing uh, quite a lot. And recently, uh, recently uh, Bangladesh uh, has uh, reached up to uh, like uh, beating China, Bangladesh took over as the number one exporter in European Union market. So, uh, there are areas where Bangladesh has ratified. For an example, Bangladesh has ratified all 29 conventions, uh, two of the four priority conventions, that is Convention 81 and 144, and 26 technical conventions. Now, Bangladesh had been uh, only one of the few countries which actually ratified all conventions that existed. However, the change in the uh, uh, conventions that were uh, Mm, a latter change so Bangladesh has to now ratify a uh, few more so the fundamentals uh, convention 87 98 100 111 29 and this is the picture of uh, ratifying the minimum wage convention uh, which is uh, popularly known as minimum wage convention so we are have been engaging in tripartite consultation on unratified conventions as well so uh, from ILO support and through uh, discussion and understanding. So we have come up with an annual work plan for reporting and how to deal with the issues. So that has been approved and uh, taken into consideration into the activities of the uh, Ministry of Labor and Employment. So uh, we have been also pursuing the amendment of uh, labor related laws so we have been pursuing institutional reform and we are also have try, uh, have uh, come up with a mechanism to uh, develop a mechanism for regular reporting for last two years we have been uh, done all reporting in time and uh, with uh, engagement from all uh, the parties concerned including tripartite consultation and with uh, the uh, advisory and uh, uh, expert opinions from ILO as well. Now, uh, we are also uh, engaging in further uh, development of the issue so that further clarification can be 
uh, done and more uh, with more clarification and understanding better understanding from all concerned we can uh, have a way forward like reporting and other aspects so we are trying to develop a case, separate case management system to deal every single uh, event and issues which can be accessed uh, through online internationally uh, and uh, which would uh, decrease and minimize the gap between the international bodies and Bangladesh and all concerned parties. So we hope in future, other than EBA and uh, transforming into GSP Plus, we would be accommodate, accommodative towards uh, the future consequences or whatever consequences it might have on the uh, uh, issues that we need to take decisions. So. It's not that we have already decided, but we are positively thinking the way forward so that we can accommodate any further ratification required on any other convention that from time to time would enable us to be in a better position. So we hope to continue uh, continuously work in uh, with along with ILO and other partners. And we are also hopeful that from uh, global examples, and good examples would be a country who can accommodate these along with uh, uh, ILO uh, so that we can ensure better future for our workers. And at the same time, it can contribute to the economy and socioeconomic development of the country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that sharing. Um, and then finally, we're going to invite Mai Nguyen from Molisa, the Ministry of Labor in, in Vietnam. Mai. Good morning, everyone. Uh, very nice to uh, meet you today. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the uh, Vietnam team, uh, today I would like to introduce some uh, our experience in the field of normative uh, strategy for Vietnam. Uh, actually, we have just uh, five minutes uh, for our presentation, then I think I should. Uh, uh, go uh, quickly and then uh, you can see on my uh, uh, screen uh, uh, the three main uh, areas that I want to share today uh, for the normative strategy for Vietnam is uh, mainstreaming uh, IRS into legal, legal documents uh, and uh, FTAs uh, uh, in the in the field of negotiation and implementation, and finally social dialogue and uh, raising the awareness of uh, partners. Uh, for the uh, mainstreaming uh, INS into legal documents in Vietnam, um, uh, you can uh, see that uh, Vietnam has uh, ratified uh, 25 conventions, uh, including uh, um, nine uh, fundamental conventions, uh, three governing uh, conventions, and uh, 13 uh, technical conventions. Uh, then uh, we think that, um, um, in principle, we, uh, uh, we have ratified uh, uh, core uh, uh, INS uh, um, instruments uh, that uh, we uh, could uh, implement it in Vietnam. And uh, as uh, team, uh, team the mayor has mentioned earlier, um, in uh, the uh, in in the field of uh, normative uh, strategy, we should focus on not only uh, we should focus uh, not only on the ratification uh, of uh, ILO conventions, uh, but also we should uh, uh, um, sh we should focus on the, the implementation of uh, uh, INS. Uh, then uh, we we now. Um, we now uh, believe that uh, um, several um, INS uh, have been uh, 
uh, mainstream in our uh, legal documents, uh, such as labor court, OSH law, social insurance law, employment law, and other legal documents. And uh, one thing, and one thing I, oh, sorry. And one thing I want to mention here is that uh, normative uh, strategy for Vietnam uh, also uh, uh, imp uh, implemented uh, uh, in reporting obligation then uh, now uh, uh, based on the help of uh, uh, the ILO, uh, we, we, uh, uh, we implement uh, the uh, um, all of the reports uh, uh, for not only for regular report but also for other reports uh, for uh, the ILO and uh, uh, we believe that uh, that the reports are now uh, uh, as good enough oh. And uh, the other thing I want to show you today is that um, based on the uh, process of negotiating and implementing FTAs, Vietnam, uh, uh, Vietnam believes that uh, we, uh, we are now leveraging, uh, leveraging uh, the, the ratification and implementation of ILO conventions. And... Uh, you know uh, the difficulties for not only not only for Vietnam but also for other countries uh, is that uh, we we should to uh, minimize the uh, other adverse uh, impacts um, that uh, that can be uh, uh, defensive or uh, or actions uh, that not good to the implementation of ILO conventions uh, uh, based on the the implementation of uh, FTIs uh, that we have been signed. And um, the, the other thing uh, involving in uh, normative uh, strategy is that uh, uh, we uh, have a good relationship uh, between uh, uh, tripartite uh, parties uh, uh, from the government, uh, the representatives of uh, employers and employees. Um, one thing uh, we want to mention about is that uh, we also have the um, uh, decision of uh, the prime minister involving the responsible business conduct. And um, uh, one of the, the most important uh, challenges and opportunities in our country is that we, uh, we are building the, aware, the common awareness uh, and we are raising the awareness of uh, people uh, in Vietnam uh, involving INS, not only policy makers, but also other stakeholders uh, and uh, to, to get the uh, consensus uh, between other stakeholders uh, that we can not only to ratify, but also to implement effectively uh, INS, uh, ILO conventions and uh, through all this or all of these activities we believe that uh, all conventions that we rat that we have been ratified and uh, all of uh, um, FTIs uh, that we uh, have been uh, signed and also other FTI that we uh, are on the way to uh, to, to to negotiate will be uh, will be implemented effectively uh, based on our uh, common awareness and consensus. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you and so sorry much. Sorry my... for the long time of my presentation. No problem at all. Thank you very much for sharing. We're glad to have you. It's very interesting to hear, you know, on the awareness raising, because uh, although the countries that are taking part uh, today are very different countries in some respects, you're all looking at the same conventions, uh, and uh, many of you are facing similar challenges, right? So I, I think we've heard from each of the countries here that the the challenge and the need for awareness raising as as one of the areas uh, to work in. Did anyone we've so we've we've had a little bit of an opportunity now for the three countries to introduce themselves a little bit, let's say, and, and hear uh, about some of the experiences. Did anyone want to ask any uh, questions from any of the presenters that have presented so far? Yeah. Uh, actually, thanks, colleagues. Uh, respected exports from the ILO. And actually, uh, hearing uh, the better progress, even in the convention ratification, even in the Bangladesh and Vietnam, it's very uh, good to hear these kinds of things. And Nepal has not so much progress. And we are trying to uh, ratify some of the convention and the protocols. Yeah. Uh, it is online. Uh, we are uh, we we are doing some kinds of job on it. But actually, uh, the the thirty six convention from the side of the Bangladesh already ratified. Yeah, it is very good. But only uh, my question would be the like this. Yeah, uh, that there is there is the convention. Uh, either it had it had uh, the parliament discussions and the, it had the matter of the parliament parliament discussion uh, and ratified it or uh, government uh, uh, itself ratified it. This is one uh, one one issue, one questions and the second question for the Vietnam. That why it is it was the subject of the parliament. Uh, or not yeah parliament it it has gone to the parliament or party parliament ratify it or government itself ratify it 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 is it it, it is my question and the second second uh, some uh, in our provision actually we have in nepal the provision it has to go to the parliament the that's why uh, it yes we have we, we have been doing some kinds of ass assessment on it yeah but uh, ultimately it requires uh, it should go to the parliament yeah uh, that's why it takes time that's why it is a very hard to difficult hard to uh, ratify yeah because there are a lot of uh, political parties representation there and they they discuss it they have uh, different kinds of thinking and something and the, the, uh, to get unanimous result it's very difficult to us yeah that's why we are thinking in line of this how to ratify it yeah because it is so hard yeah and nowadays there are kinds of two kinds of argument in nepal yeah that's why it is not necessary to send and uh, the parliament uh, uh, the government uh, himself can ratify it uh, the cabinet ratify it something like this this kind of argument, argument is also uh, yeah uh, in the, in nepal that's why this is the question for vietnam and the uh, bangladesh yeah Okay, very interesting question. Let me try to summarize it and you tell me if it's correct, right? So what I'm hearing is part one of your question is who's doing the ratification? Is it the executive or is it parliament in your countries, right? Part two of the question is if it's parliament, how did you convince all of these parties to actually do so, right? Um, so fantastic. So I think we've got one person who wants to speak to this. I'm going to head over here and just introduce yourself as well. Uh this is Akim Reza Rahman, Deputy Secretary, Minister of Labor and Employment. Here I am presenting the government from government of Bangladesh part. So as a country, Bangladesh, this is a thing. This is, First of all, thank you very much for the very nice and practical question. The thing is that obviously this is done in the parliament. However, like in any modern democracy, Bangladesh has judiciary, executive and legislature both uh, each working independently of each other. However, this is done in different layers. So part of the executive actually process 
the tripartite consultation and other things. So we need to take the con uh, concern of all stakeholders. So that is then processed, channelized, and that goes to the cabinet through cabinet approval that goes to the parliament. Then after it gets the parliament's approval, then only it can be ratified as a country, as a nation. Thank you. I hope you understand. So like, uh, so uh, if, uh, anything uh, other than uh, like uh, which requires the approval of the uh, legislature so it uh, goes through the cabinet and then ca the ca if the cabinet approves then it is finally ratified so to your question uh, it is obviously it uh, in cases it might go to the legislature or in cases it might not go to the legislature but it obviously will get the approval of the cabinet Do you like that? Oh, no. So, uh, yes. Could we make it clear to you? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, first, it got, I think, consensus through the cabinet process. After the approval of the cabinet, then it go to the parliament for the uh, for the for the ratification or for the approval of the parliamentary process. And after the approval of the parliament, then it got ratified. It's, and uh, okay. You have a question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, actually, I want to supplement uh, Mr. Reza Rahman. For ratification of any convention, only cabinet is enough. It should not go to the parliament. But for amendment of law, this should go to the uh, parliament. Thank you. Ah, so that's a subtle distinction there. Um, okay, great. Did you have any follow-ups on this? Or is it clear? Good. Uh, Vietnam, would you like to add to this? Yes. My... Uh, thank you for your question. Actually, this question uh, always be asked uh, in Vietnam whenever we have some conventions or some treaties uh, that uh, that um, uh, should be uh, ratified or uh, signed. Um, actually, in our legal system, we have laws uh, um, and uh, lower legal systems like uh, decrees or circulars. Then uh, if uh, that treaty or that uh, convention um, can make the revise uh, re the revision of uh, laws, it should be submitted uh, into the parliament we call the uh, National Assembly in Vietnam. And uh, other conventions or treaties uh, that, uh, that don't affect uh, to the revision of our laws, it means that uh, uh, that treaties or convention will be uh, applied directly in Vietnam or uh, that treaties or conventions uh, will, uh, will make the revision of uh, uh, lower legal documents such as decrees or circulars that should be submitted uh, by the prime minister or by our government or by, uh, by our Per, uh, by, by our president in Vietnam, it depends. It depends on the content of uh, that treaties or conventions. Uh, I hope uh, this answer can be shown for for your confusing. Uh, and the second second uh, question uh, involving in the uh, persuading other stakeholders uh, when uh, uh, processing your um, ratification or your signature of uh, conventions or treaties, as I mentioned in my presentation, that uh, we should have uh, um, we should raise uh, our uh, uh, we should raise the awareness of uh, other stakeholders, not only policy maker, makers, but also uh, employers, employees, and um, uh, and sometimes uh, all of our citizens nationwide. Uh, then, uh, uh, based on the based on the advice of Tinder Mayor that we have uh, listened earlier, uh, we. Uh, 
we we uh, mainstream we mainstream uh, uh, the raising uh, the awareness raising by uh, the process of uh, preparing uh, our reports our convention reports or um, uh, we uh, uh, we uh, mainstream uh, it into uh, our the into the process of uh, convention ratifications or um, Sometimes uh, in the negotiating of uh, FDIs, such as we are negotiating uh, IPEP or Asian uh, uh, Canada uh, uh, FDI, uh, then uh, uh, on the on the way to uh, negotiate the with other countries uh, uh, involving in this uh, FTIs, we in the main uh, in the same time. We convince uh, uh, the uh, the bosses uh, in uh, our government, uh, um, the, the senior experts and other stakeholders uh, when uh, we doing this process. And uh, I hope uh, our experience uh, could uh, help your. Uh, country uh, uh, involving in the uh, ratification uh, and application of INS. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So so it sounds like what you're saying is the key to getting the other political parties on board is actually working through the different social partners and, and, and getting them to and doing this awareness raising, right? Yeah. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. I think we've got one more question. Oh, is this a comment on this is additional? Okay, great. Let's go there. And then we'll go to your question. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, I have a question to the Vietnam colleagues that uh, they have a ratification, I think, uh, 27 convention. So, so question for the Vietnam colleagues. You, yeah, you, you ratified 27 convention. 25. Okay. Uh, it is my interest to know that how the workers enjoying this uh, ratified uh, convention with 87 and 98. They enjoying this uh, ratification, the convention 87 and 98, and how that, and how many convention they have implement in the uh, in their country, because uh, uh, because uh, so many countries they ratified so many convention but not implement properly. Mm. So it is my question up to Vietnam, how they are doing these things uh, in there for the workers. So so the question is, how's the implementation going? If I understand correctly. Okay. Did you want to speak to that or did anyone want to speak to that? Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, could you explain more for your question? Uh, do you want to ask about the role of uh, the representative of the workers, right? Yeah. No, uh, no, you have a ratified 25 convention. Yes. How many are implementing in that your, in your uh, country? And how the workers are enjoying the uh, convention 98 and 87? How they are bargaining with the, uh, in their part? It's a, let, me, let me clear the question. Yeah. Uh, the government of, of Vietnam, mm -hmm. the uh, ratified 25 conventions, yes. ILO conventions. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is the reflection in your law mm. concerning the ratified conventions? And what is the uh, status of implementation mm. of those laws which are concerning the ILO conventions, which is ratified by you? That is the question actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, we we are very happy to inform that uh, in our labor court uh, many uh, aspects uh, many uh, ins uh, have been uh, mainstream in our labor court including the collective bargaining and the uh, procedure to uh, to make collective bargaining and other issue in our labor court 
and up to now, uh, uh, from the, the the enforcement of that labor court from uh, 2020, uh, we uh, we haven't got any difficulties uh, in the in the implementation of this uh, labor court. And and uh, the, uh, thanks to the help of the ILO uh, uh, in uh, in the process of uh, uh, building that labor court, then we can uh, uh, then we can in integrate the many uh, international labor standards in Convention eighty nine and Convention. Uh, and sorry, uh, uh, Convention 87 and Convention 98 into our uh, uh, labor court. Um, although we haven't uh, ratified Convention 87 yet, but uh, many international labor standards in that convention uh, have been uh, um, have been regulated in uh, this uh, labor court, and. Um, uh, on uh, on of uh, this uh, uh, process, we have uh, the consultation of uh, the representative of uh, em uh, employees. Uh, then uh, I think um, in this aspect, uh, I should uh, uh, hand over to uh, the representative of uh, um, workers to uh, have uh, some more information for you. Uh, hello everyone, I'm Ming from the International Department of VGCL, Vietnam General Confederation of Labor. So I will try to translate uh, Mr. Long's speech into English uh, because his English is not quite good. Okay. Uh, Việt Nam đã cơ bản là phê chuẩn 878 công ước của ILO và 78 công ước. Bây giờ sẽ kiểm tra về các chính sách. Ở tầm một mình, Việt Nam has ratified uh, 9 out of 10 uh, conventions of the ILO. ILO. Mm, fundamental conventions of uh, ILO. Uh, in the time of um, internet, uh, internationalized with the international uh, standard, I mean, I also try to internalize many uh, laws uh, to make sure that we adapt to the international standards. Uh, with the law about uh, in, in terms of the social protection and um, uh, the law, uh, Ms. Mai has uh, shared about this experience from the labor court. At the moment, we are, we are now as a VGCL are trying to um, persuade and um, try to amend the law to make sure that we can uh, adapt to the uh the to, to adapt to the uh, to, we are trying to uh, amend the uh, trade union law to adapt to the international standard uh, based on the plan we are going to uh, put the law into the national assembly assembly in the in the 2024 of may and um, maybe put into effect in the October of the same year. Uh, at the same time, we are trying to um, um, prepare the procedure to um, to 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 put the eighty eighty seven convention into effect. Uh, thank Great. you. Thank you. So clearly, there's a lot of experience with uh, implementation here. Tim, did you want to add to this? Yeah, just just adding because we we actually did quite a bit of work in Vietnam, I think, and we continue to do a lot of work, um, not just on the ratification and not just on the application, but on really on the legal system in uh, in Vietnam and uh, on two different occasions, 2012 and. 2019, we had a significant process over one, two years um, doing workshops, 
um, having consultations even with the designated committee in the National Assembly um, to make improvements to the labor to the labor code to revise the labor code and then obviously we are looking at all of these issues that that we discussed uh, discussed earlier including uh, and that is the big change that was then made in 20, 2019 when for the first time um, the notion of work independent workers representative organizations at enterprise level was introduced in the uh, in the labor code uh, which then forms the the basis for collective bargaining we of course know and i think all of you will ex have experienced this the standards under convention number 98 and 87 can be demanding yeah they can be very demanding um they require a level of independence um, of workers and employers organizations that we think in the organization is needed in order to make workplace cooperation to make collective bargaining meaningful yeah um, one, one of the issues that vietnam had um i think you'll readily agree with that this is a significant number of wildcat strikes um and in order to come to grip one of the the ways that we recommend to come to grip with wildcat, with wildcat strikes is precisely to get um, to get a labor relations system um, organized uh, where the space is created for workers and employers to negotiate their own conditions. But when they negotiate their conditions, to also stick to the to the commitments to the commitments that have been made. Now all of this is still is still work in progress but the main point here is that um on two occasions and for sure uh before we're 10 years down the line there will be a third process um a significant uh, in investment was was made with the support from from donors to gradually make those changes in the labor code that gradually provide that opening for for social dialogue is that more or less correct Great. Yes. Thank you, Tim. So I, I'll, I think we've got a couple of, is this a, a follow-up question? Yeah. So we've got a couple of follow-up questions. I just want to um, make a note to people that to keep your questions and your answers short, because you are standing in between our participants and coffee break. Okay. So just a, just a short, short note on that, but go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Actually, uh, from Bangladesh side, I'm the, from the, I'm from the trade unions. Uh, my name is Shakil. Actually, we came here actually just to learn from the case of Vietnam. We know that you have graduated. You have a lot of best practices and good experiences. That's why my specific question is whether you are enjoying the right of uh, right to organize and collective bargaining. That is very important. If you really enjoying right to organize, then how many of the percentage of your uh, workforce in the union? I mean, organized work workforce is how, how many? What is the percentage? And how are you enjoying in terms of form forming unions as well as collective bargaining, social dialogue, et cetera, et cetera, even up to the plant level. That is what actually I want to know from you. Thank you so much. So there's a little bit of, of discussion happening amongst the Vietnam group, uh, but I think the, the answer will, will, did you want to speak to that or? Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Maybe, maybe what I can do is, is while they discuss, I, I have a backlog. So I have, I have a question here first. Oh, two questions. Oh my goodness. Okay. Let's group the questions together. Okay. So I think I see four questions here. We're going to go to these two and then later we're going to go to 
It is a sharing. Okay, we'll keep that for a moment, right? Let's go to the questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, actually, the, since Vietnam has uh, graduated from LDC, I think we have a lot to learn from Vietnam. Uh, to my understanding, according to the uh, Prime Minister directives, the uh, state-owned inspectors by inspection body must not inspect the, it's a factory must inspect only once in a year to, to my understanding but for this case they have introduced the self-inspection and self-assessment i just want to know how this work the self-inspection if one is more than one inspect, inspection cannot be conducted by state-owned inspection bodies how they ensure the compliance thank you This is for Vietnam, for Vietnam. Did you hear the question? This is a, is, is this related to this question? No, not, not, no, not yet, not yet. <laughs> are, you, are you ready to respond? Yeah. Yes, okay, so we'll do this and then we'll come back to you, all right? And then we'll come to you too, yes. Uh, sorry, can I sit here? Uh, of course. Do I have to stand? No, no, no okay. Need, no need. Yeah, no. I saw okay. Uh, for the first question, uh, I want to answer uh, in the time of um, putting the trade union law into effect, especially the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, trade union, especially the VCCL, have participated with many parties to make the law into effect. So uh, we can probably say that uh, workers in Vietnam are very enjoying the collective bargaining agreement. Thank you. And, uh, I, go, go ask them over coffee break. <laughs> go ask them over coffee. I think there's a more detailed, I think you have a more detailed question and, and maybe, you know, doing it back and forth is not the best way to do it. Um, perhaps we'll, we'll go to the, the two sharings, okay? Go ahead. Uh, actually, actually, the applications of the, all the provisions of the uh, convention and protocols uh, in the law and code and something like that, it is not so difficult. The actual difficulty is there, you know, to implementation, the whole provisions uh, of the convention and the laws and the constitutions, etc., is very difficult. Uh, here in Nepal, actually, we have good kinds of experience. Even we are more pro proactive, yeah, you know, uh, even though we are not uh, ratify many conventions, the provisions of the convention, more or less, is in the replication of the, our constitutions. Constitutions is more proactive constitution we have, you know. Ra, pro, con the provisions of the constitu constitutions uh, of Nepal actually incorporating the all the all the provisions of the code and the conduct, which is uh, provisions by the uh, convention and the. Uh, protocols and the recommendations. This is very uh, good example for us. But some, uh, even though we uh, ratify the very few conventions, only 11, 11 conventions, fundamental, core, and technical conventions, all together, only 11 conventions. But the provisions of all these conventions is clearly mentioned in our constitution. It is very interesting, yeah. Interesting. Thank you for sharing. And then our last sharing right over here. Uh, this is Yogendra Kaur uh, from Nepal, uh, president of Nepal Trade Union Congress. Uh, I want to like uh, add something about uh, the this uh, ILS about ILS mm -hmm. uh, in Nepal. Uh, just brother Dandu say already said in Nepal we have ratified only eleven convention, seven court con con convention except except eighty seven, and one convention uh, governance convention on forty four, and our technical four conventions. 
we have passed uh, ratification uh, 11 conventions. We are trying to long time for a long time to ratification 87. But we did not success. Uh, I respect government of Vietnam and government of Bangladesh. More convention uh, have already passed. 36 convention from Bangladesh side and 25 convention from Vietnam side. In Nepal, uh, we ratified few convention, but uh, we have success to introduce our spirit of convention, freedom of association, right to organizing and right to collective bargaining with contribution based social security as a fundamental right in our constitution in 2015. It is our achievement. So I want to know your observation from ILO side. What is the condition of adoption and implementation of between three countries in uh, on the process of decent work and related with trade union right and trade union okay, uh, human right? Thanks. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. So looking for, for some thoughts on, on how everyone stands from the ILO side. I don't think we're going to do some sharing on that just yet. Um, what I do want to do is I want to head to our coffee break. And, uh, and, and so I have, but I have something for you. I'm going to give you 20 minutes for coffee break. But uh, Bangladesh, you folks go talk to Vietnam. You have some detailed questions. Where, where's Tim? We rope Tim into this conversation as well. Uh, there you are. Uh, uh, so Tim can help out, kind of uh, uh, um, perhaps help translate between these two groups. Um, and then this is your opportunity to ask some of those detailed questions. Also, I think that there are some things that people are not going to say on the mic microphone, right? How did we get these political parties all, you know, working together? This is your opportunity to do that, right? So, so use the use the coffee break wisely. It's just outside, and like I said, we've got twenty minutes for it. So we are going to do uh, today. The structure of our session is we're going to do two sharings. So we've just, just finished the first one, right? The first one on normative strategies. The second one is on gender equality. And we're going to start with a presentation and then we're going to do the, the country experience sharing. And just the one thing that uh, I, I will uh, set maybe some expectations around is I, I know that we want to make space for everyone to be heard, but I do not think we can have all of the conversations in plenary. Otherwise, this is a three-day workshop, right? So we're going to have to have some smaller group conversations. I was very happy to see during the coffee break, I think there was some sharing between different countries, so fantastic, right? Because we will not be able to have all of the questions answered and all of the conversations right here um, in the plenary group. So we're going to move into uh, gender equality. And uh, we've got a presentation uh, from Johnny uh, Simpson once again. And so you folks will recall uh, Johnny Simpson from the online training. And Johnny has uh, shared with us uh, some uh, recorded comments. Uh, Johnny is the senior specialist on gender equality uh, and discrimination with the ILO Decent Work Team for East Asia um, here in Bangkok, but actually she's been pulled away to take part in a global uh, retreat. Um, so that's why she has left us with the video. So we're going to start with Johnny, and then we're going to go into the country uh, experience sharing like we did last time. So let's hear from Johnny. This is Joni Simpson, and I'm showing you once again the uh, slide of our transformative agenda for gender equality, because these are really the underlying issues that, that we've identified that need to be addressed in order for uh, gender equality to advance in the world of work. And I wanted to suggest uh, the focus specifically on Convention 190, which links both to discrimination, C111, as well as to um, the fundamental uh, principle and right at work 
for safe and healthy work environments. And um, I thought it would be uh, a good uh, area because there is a lot of momentum here and a lot of good tools and practical experiences. So of course, there's the element of legislative reviews. Um, for example, recently Vietnam reviewed their law on sexual harassment and updated it. Um, there are a lot of other countries in the region also looking towards that. Then there are tools uh, in order to implement a law and uh, legislation that is there. Usually on sexual harassment, it's already in place. The aspect of uh, the, the broad um, uh, scope that the uh, convention covers of violence and harassment at work is not necessarily yet part of uh, legislation, but sexual harassment is definitely, and uh, a lot of um, reference to it as well in terms of global supply chains uh, and trade agreements. So there's an opportunity there. Uh, and then the third aspect uh, uh, after the implementation of legislation like codes of conduct and guidelines or uh, standard operating procedures um, or uh, looking at um, uh, sectoral uh, agreements, collective bargaining clause, clauses on C-190. A lot of this is emerging and available. There's a lot of resources being uh, developed at this time, and we've got a good capacity building um, uh, guide on the ILO platform, which I will share at the end of this uh, short presentation. And then finally, capacity building, um, all the training and elements that have that is, are happening in terms of awareness raising, building up the uh, understanding, the common understanding, both at the national level in order to make ratifications move ahead and, and in order to advance legislation, but then at the sectoral level and linked to global supply chains, uh, look to highly feminized sectors, for example, well, the garment sector is a given. We've got a lot of experience there that you can draw from in countries uh, where better work is. You can um, exchange, maybe scale some or, or pilot and scale some of the good practices that you can uh, share across countries. Uh, other care sector is another highly feminized sector with a lot of uh, issues related to violence and harassment and um, occupational safety and health. So you might want to look there and I'm sure you'll find uh, practices across countries uh, looking at improving the working conditions of care workers, be they domestic workers, health and social care workers, child care workers, long-term worker uh, care workers, you can find the um, the entry point and where you can make the biggest um, uh, impact. Agriculture is another area where there are a lot of women working and a lot of decent work deficits there as well. Violence and harassment at work could be a very um, good entry point. And then finally, I'd say tourism. A lot of the countries in, in the region have uh, vibrant tourism sectors and um, tourism is, is an area that is fraught as well, especially for young women with a lot of uh, issues um, related to violence and harassment at work. So you've got a few sectors there, um, garment, care, agriculture, tourism, then uh, looking to what each country has in terms of, of uh, ongoing work and experiences, either on specifically on sexual harassment or perhaps on the broader spectrum of violence and harassment. Uh, for example, the better work tools and sectoral approaches, the standard operating procedures or guidelines, um, Vietnam did the tripartite code of conduct, very interesting because it helps to implement the legislation, it gets tripartite partners behind it, and then it cascades down with training and uh, tools, and they're doing that right now uh, towards an updated code of conduct. Um, in Malaysia, the employers there, MEF, just uh, are rolling out a uh, guideline for handling grievances of violence and harassment at work that could be interesting to explore. And then I wanted to raise the issue of consultation because I heard that throughout your sessions uh, last week. 
And in terms of what I've experienced myself under C-190, I would say that uh, the Philippines has an interesting model because they've really done a broad um, approach to getting all, all of society behind the understanding that violence and harassment at work is unacceptable uh, and um, is a violation of people's right to work free from violence and harassment. So you might want to look to them. Uh, last couple of points before I go and before you start talking. We're finalizing a, a C-190 brief, uh, a C-190 being the Violence and Harassment Convention, and we'll be sharing it soon. And it talks about what, it, what different countries are doing in terms of promoting it. And we're, we're really almost there with regards to this brief, so we will be able to share share it with you shortly. And um, then last point is that many bilaterals, uh, not only the bilateral, the, the, the governments involved in the trade agreements, um, but also bilaterals in terms of resource mobilization. Uh, many bilaterals have um, so-called feminist foreign policies right now. That's an opportunity for resource mobilization. Uh, Global Affairs Canada, where I'm from originally, uh, they have one. Uh, they also ratified CY90 recently, so that's a, that's also good. Um, the Australians, DFAT, Australia also just recently ratified C-190, so that could be a, a nice connection for working in this area and um, mobilizing some resources from them. CETA, the Swedish uh, government, is also very much behind a feminist uh, foreign policy, although they haven't ratified. And um, I wish you a lot of success in these exciting uh, discussions you'll have, and um, I'll be looking forward to hearing about it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank Johnny. So we're now going to do a little bit of country experience sharing on this. We have uh, three people who will be sharing country experiences related to the gender uh, aspects of ILS. And we're going to start off with uh, Hansa, who's a senior expert with the Federation of Nepal Chambers of Commerce and Industry. So Hansa, if you'd like to uh, share, would you want the microphone or are you going to stand over there? Okay, great. Yes, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, it's a good, a very good uh, morning. Uh, my presentation, I will limit my presentation within the time frame, but maybe uh, will take some time. Yes, I represent uh, employees organization of Nepal. It's a Federation of Nepali Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Uh, FNCCI. FNCCI is the most representative uh, uh, business organization in Nepal. It has nationwide network. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, it has nationwide network, represents uh, a business at national and international level and play a catalyst role to promote industry and uh, uh, economic growth in the country and deals with uh, various labor related issues including uh, the all social clauses and the issues uh, and yes nepal uh, ldc graduation i have uh, its impact on trade and investment yes it is uh, uh, under the process and the preparation stage we are now from december 26 nepal will graduate uh, in a developing country. Following the graduation, uh, Nepal will uh, face some challenges and issues that will affect in the international trade uh, and the labor standard as well as human rights. And uh, these uh, are the major issues. Assessment of possible implication of trade and investment is underway. Review of reformation and existing policy is on the focused area of uh, uh, business association as well as of the government and the trade union as well. Uh, uh, promotion of labor standard uh, is at the forefront. Uh, Nepal has already ratified. It is already mentioned by our colleagues uh, who spoke uh, earlier. And now we are in the process of uh, study uh, for, uh, 
who ratified the convention, 81, 185, 87, 190 is cur currently under discussion and review process. Uh, activities, uh, now I would like to focus on the activities. Uh, uh, activities that uh, FNCCI as an employees organization taking into uh, action uh, is the one of the activity is gender promotion of gender equality in the country. Gender equality is important and ensuring for the social justice and uh, uh, equal opportunity. It is linked with the labor standard as well as the labor rights. Gender equality, social inclusion, elimination of discrimination in employment, occupation are some of the key priorities areas where uh, FNCCI is working and these are the, uh, the uh, directly linked with the promotion of decent work environment in the country as well. Uh, FNCCI has been working closely uh, with uh, all uh, social partners, government and the trade unions as well, and we have given uh, emphasis uh, on the social dialogue. Through social dialogue, we have been implementing uh, uh, various uh, activities. One of the activities is gender equality. We have uh, promote a code of conduct uh, that is, uh, uh, a, uh, this is in Nepali, but uh, English version we have used. This is a code of conduct prepared for the industry in Nepal, that so that industry can adopt this code of conduct to promote the gender equality and to eliminate uh, the sexual uh, harass, uh, harassment and violence at the work plus. Code of conduct is uh, uh, designed with the objective of to facilitate the member companies uh, to uh, implement uh, it and to uh, promote the gender equality at the workplace. The code of conduct uh, includes the code of conduct. Uh, okay. The code of conduct uh, includes uh, its objective, why we uh, prepared this code of conduct and the definition of violence and harassment and the types, nature and the gravity of the violence and harassment and uh, the individual and the manager's responsibility, the employee and the manager's responsibility is also mentioned here to respect the code of conduct. Also, there is the, the provision of mechanism uh, if someone uh, is victimized from the sexual harassment and the violation, the he or she can register complaint to the uh, uh, company uh, company designated person, and also the company or enterprise has to take necessary action uh, to redress all the complaint. Uh, these are some of the uh, major uh, uh, component of the code of conduct. I do hope that this code of implementation of this code of conduct will be uh, helpful to uh, promote gender equality and uh, eliminate sexual harassment at the workplace. With this, I thank you very much. Well, it's great to know about this. So thanks so much, uh, Hansa, for, for sharing. Uh, next, we're going to head over to Shaquille in Bangladesh, who's the General Secretary with the Bangladesh uh, Labor Federation. Shaquille, do you want to use this or here? Okay. Thank you once again. Uh, still good morning. My name is Shakil Akhtar Choudhury. I'm the General Secretary for Bangladesh Labor Federation. I am also the member of National TCC. Uh, thanks for the presentations on gender. Let me share some of the contexts and scenarios in Bangladesh. Uh, I will be focusing on the gender issues. Uh, let me share with you some of the contexts first. Gender issues are given priorities for the trade unions in Bangladesh, especially for the I mean, trade union uh, area, the world of work. Uh, there are growing women participation in the world of work, which is now 42.68%, uh, which was only 36%. Uh, uh, this is not 2022, it is only five years back, 2017. 
uh, reach out issues are very crucial due to informalities, which is now stands at 87%. Uh, I mean, informality in Bangladesh. Uh, there are some pressures from the inside the country and outside the country. Uh, the forces are <clears throat> now very active uh, for gender issues. And uh, in Bangladesh, there is a, a question of mainstreaming the women's uh, in term of mm, in term of uh, mainstreaming, empowering the women's. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Let's let me share some of the possibilities. Uh, we have our constitution, which is really uh, positive for uh, uh, gender equality, etc. Uh, we have our national law, our labor law, and the law on protection against women and children, anti trafficking laws. These are, uh, uh, I will say that these are very good uh, context according to our law. Uh, we have our high court verdict, uh, which was uh, uh, de declared by the high court 2010 uh, to protect gender-based violence and harassments. Uh, we have our gender uh, roadmap by DIFE, Department of uh, uh, in uh, Industries and factories and establishment. Uh, this is very much focused on GVV. Uh, uh, and then the operational strategy to prevent gender based violence by Ministry of Labor and Employment. And uh, operational strategy to prevent gender based violence. Okay. And then ILO roadmap and EU action plan, which is uh, a commitment by the government of Bangladesh and that is being implemented for last couple of years. Uh, we have our SDG, which is another commitment from the government that we have to achieve by 2030, uh, which is uh, I, uh, SDG uh, goal number five, number eight, and some other two. We have our anti-harassment committee at the factory level, according to our law. Uh, then gender responsive attitude from all the parties, especially I will say, that the government, the employers, and the trade unions, and the other development partners, the CSOs, all of them are very much positive on this. Next slide. <clears throat> the limitations and challenges, weak implementation of law. This is very you know, crucial area. Then trade union inclusion is very poor. Informality, as I mentioned before, it is around 87% and poor unionization rate, lack of capacity, capacity of the trade unions, and I will say for all the implementation parties, and then lack of combined effort, I mean tripartite plus, uh, we need sort of, you know, uh, combined effort. Next slide, please. Uh, our efforts, what are the efforts that uh, are existing in the country? Campaign for mass awareness, lobby and advocacy, to ratify C-189 and 190, raised and discussed the issue in the Tripartite Consultative Committee, TCC, and submit a memorandum to the Prime Minister uh, to ratify C-190. Just last year, we have submitted a, a memorandum to the Prime Minister. Raised voice to strengthen labor administration. Uh, trade Union ILS Committee, we have our committee comprising the mainstream trade union federations in the country to process the, and analyzing reports on gender issues and submitting reports to the government, the ILO, for the last two years. Uh, trade unions are very much active on this. Collaborating with national and international initiatives. I think the last slide, next. Yeah, and way forward, strengthen tripartite actions, capacity building, capacity building, especially for trade unions, and then continue mass campaign, and uh, networking at national, regional, and global level, strengthen social dialogue and collaborative uh, bargaining, collective bargaining, and then increase women inclusion and for mainstreaming, ensuring democratic practices at all levels, especially at the, from the factory level to the national level, uh, from policy to implementation. And I think that's all from my side. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much. And then finally, we have Trier, uh, who is a senior program officer, the head of program unit at ILO in Bangkok. Do you have the remote control there? Yes, you do. Great. Sorry. Uh, ILO Vietnam. It's not ILO Bangkok. Sorry. What did I say? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, that, that you're right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm uh, as a member of the National Task Force on the uh, gender equality on behalf of the uh, Task Force, not only the ILO, but national partner. I just give you the few uh, uh, highlights from the uh, gender link to development starting from Vietnam. So legal, uh, as you know, that's the legal framework for prevention of sexual harassment at workplace. I, uh, the, the issue that I would like to, to share with you as the one part of the gender equality promotion and effort. And all of the uh, uh, reference uh, document is about the ILO International Labor Standard, uh, already mentioned, as an international commitment that Vietnam have to have to be uh, uh, committed, uh, country labor code, and as a uh, relevant law, for example, uh, gender equality law, and as a uh, policy document. And uh, importantly, uh, recently, the implementing decree and technical guideline for the labor code implementation and convention application. And um, recently, uh, as you mentioned about the human rights due diligence, also mentioned about the gender equality and also sexual harassment prevention at workplace. And many of the other social audit tools that enterprise have to uh, follow and, 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 and apply. And uh, uh, last but not least is enterprise work rule and uh, policy that uh, sexual harassment it should be the responsible of the enterprise to to uh, to to make sure that it's free and uh, and um, uh, uh, no uh, uh, sexual harassment at workplace. So um, uh, how's the legal framework in Vietnam? And the first time that the definition of the sexual harassment have been already included into the labor code uh, 2019 with the fully in uh, the definition. Uh, for implementation, uh, so far, the, as, is, as mentioned, the National Task Force has already been uh, gathering and also uh, conducting a number of important uh, work related to the prevention of sexual harassment. First, revising the code of conduct. Code of conduct for prevention of sexual harassment is a, uh, signed by tripartite partner, government, employer, and worker, and we are revising it and submitting for the for for the uh, for the approval. Accordingly, the revise of the developing of the training material on how the sexual uh, harassment prevention at enterprise have to be uh, uh, implemented. Uh, the uh, the material already uh, piloted in the some enterprise, and the finalizing material is being made. Um, number of the training you know, to for the enterprise for the worker representative organize uh, for worker representative or also have already conducted uh, and also the uh, uh, labor authority also trained on the monitoring of the sexual harassment prevention at the as the enterprise and we are and we are going to support also the Moliza and partner to digitalize the material for easy up and wide access by the representative and also audience. So uh, support the inclusion of the uh, prevention sexual harassment in the factory enterprise worker rule and compliance. So it's important that uh, enterprise know about the responsible, their, their duty, and they make sure that the healthy and also uh, a safety working environment for the worker. Uh, for the bad to work, for the government uh, sector, as it's, uh, our Bangladesh uh, may, may know, we also trimming, yeah, it means men trimming the prevention of sexual harassment in the training for both uh, worker and employer at the government industry. Uh, promoting the collective bargaining and social dialogue among worker and employer for common understanding of the issue. Uh, it means that the, both of them have to understand about the issue and to have the common understanding and common effort to mainstream uh, uh, the uh, sexual harassment prevention in their work rule and implementation. Improving the labor dispute settlement as a support system. As you know, that if sexual harassment uh, happen, then another system have to uh, support. And online technical support uh, for the enterprise, because many enterprise do not have the capacity or time for 
for the technical. So the, uh, the National Task Force set up the online uh, support for enterprise. In addition to that, the, the Task Force also agreed for promotion of the C-190 of the ILO. Uh, as you know, that uh, 190 is very important. Uh, so that the 190 already included into the, our uh, memo understanding on the international labor standard promotion. And number of the material for promotion number C-190 have already been uploaded in both government and also the uh, ILO website. And uh, in, uh, importantly, the C-190 are also uh, be aware and highlighted by the government and social partner for incorporating mainstreaming into their program and project. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm I'm short, and then we look forward to have your question or any of the our conversation exchanging will be and welcome. Thank you very much. Excellent. So thank you. Um, so thanks to all three of our uh, uh, participants for sharing on their country experiences around the gender related aspects of ILS. I'm not going to go into a Q&A just yet because we're going to do some small group discussions uh, in a little bit. So our next piece in the agenda is on South-South and triangular cooperation in the 2030 agenda. We're going to have a, a bit of an introduction to this topic. And then what we're going to do is we're going to actually make use of those tables at the back uh, to, have some, to, some, to have some group discussions. So I do want to invite our uh, two speakers up who will be sharing on this. You've all, um, almost all of you, I think, have met Nancy at this point. She is a development cooperation officer with partnerships at ILO in Geneva. And we're going to hook her into the screen so that she can show you a great online platform that all of you folks can use um, but also some uh, content from that platform for a little bit of uh, discussion. Would... Pass your microphone, yeah. Thank you, Carl, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad to be here with you today. Uh, so let's uh, dive a little bit into what is South-South and Triangle Cooperation and uh, how it's uh, first with the uh, the 2030 agenda. So, as you may know, the ILO is committed to the promotion of uh, South South and Jungle cooperation, recognizing it as a key way uh, to promote decent work for all. SSTC is also a strategic vehicle for promoting mutually benefic beneficial learning and cooperation in uh, support of 2030 agenda. Uh, as this SSTC divides into two modalities. First one is a South-South cooperation, which is a cooperation between directly two or more countries from Global South. When we add to this uh, interesting combination some traditional Northern partners, uh, we get the triangle cooperation. The participants from uh, Northern part can be different. It can be some financial support, it can be technical support uh, or other participation. Uh, so, when we are talking about Global South, we should keep in mind that this is not about only geographical uh, belonging of the country, but it's mostly about the uh, developing countries and uh, least developed countries in themselves. Uh, among over here, you can see the map, and maybe you will find you will see here one mistake on this map because this part should be also red, as uh, Russia belongs despite their geographical position and belongs to the Global South. Uh, among the uh, other things, we can see modalities, sub-modalities of uh, South-South and general cooperation. So the first one is regional cooperation. And uh, as an example to illustrate this, I can uh, mention the project of uh, strengthening public employment services uh, in IGAT region. It was the Ethiopian initiative, which was later supported by other countries in the region. Uh, and uh, supported by Jobs Creation Co Commission as well. There's also sub-regional cooperation. Uh, for um, example, I can uh, illustrate it uh, inclusion, of, inclus inclusion sorry, of vulnerable uh, group in vocational training, which is also a suggestion from Mexico initially, but later was uh, supported by uh, Caribbean and uh, were well, uh, Pre pre prepared by ITC ILO Turin. There's also interregional cooperation, uh, which is, uh, well, well, as good examples can be a BRICS 
uh, training knowledge series on uh, transition to formal economy. It was an e-format and it took six weeks of very intensive work, including uh, workshops, uh, including the group exchange and uh, other cooperation. So this exists city to city cooperation. Uh, here, for example, I can uh, mention the Maputa roadmap, uh, which was uh, to, which was uh, between Maputo, Palo Horizonte, uh, Porto Alegro, and Durban for uh, local economies. There is a fragile to fragile cooperation. Uh, the good example of this will be uh, cross border trade in uh, Muno River Union, which was aimed on involving women and uh, in uh, trader economy. And cooperation among small island developing states. Well, here we have peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, seminar and just transition for uh, Samoa. Uh, here is. Uh, so South and general cooperation is based on solidarity among of uh, equals and the positive effectiveness of similarity context, context among the actors. Uh, the context can be uh, geographical, cultural, economic, political, or social. Similar challenges and experience make uh, one country's best practices highly adaptable to another country in the South. Uh, here on the screen, you can see the principles of uh, South South and general cooperation. And uh, <clears throat> just a little historical note that uh, it was in uh, 1978 in Buenos Aires was adopted uh, Buenos Aires Action Plan, BAPA, where these principles were listed. And in uh, 2016, uh, the Global South countries re reaffirmed their commitment to these principles, which in the adopt final documents and got uh, the name of BAPA plus 40, which we often use for this. And now, uh, I would love to check your knowledge. And here on the screen, you can see. Yes, yeah, so let's check how carefully you were listening to me. Uh, so what type of cooperation will be cooperation among Latin American and Caribbean countries? Okay, let's, let's connect. We'll check later. The next one, cooperation between members of the Indian community. A, a bit louder, please. Sub, sub regional. Inter regional, okay. Sub state. Brazil to Brazil Okay, cooperation between Maputo, Durban, and Porto Alegre. City to city. Great. Cooperation between Costa Rica and Malaysia. Interregional, so we replace. Okay. Cooperation between Haiti, Samoa, and East Timor. Small island. Cooperation between Sierra Leone and Somalia. So let's check. Perfect. You're a great student. <laughs> okay, and then, then we go next uh, to step by step South and Triangle Cooperation. Uh, yes. uh, SSTC is established by demand. That means that actor from the country from South identifies uh, for himself the need to find a solution to a specific challenge and propose cooperation to other actors from Global South. Uh, here you can see the key players for ILO in this regard. This is an uh, important thing to mention that uh, in South-South and general cooperation, we avoid using the word donor because in this equal partnership, we are all developing partners. Uh, so let's have a look in key steps for successful South-South cooperation in five steps. First one is definition. Uh, this means that in three main parts, you need to, def you need to identify problem, partners, and funding sources for solving this. The next one is the developing development of the project. 
it's a designing project with uh, uh, with uh, including uh, this development uh, dec decent uh, work country plan uh 2030 agenda and other relevant documents for us uh the next step will be implementation of the project and here well i think one of the most important things here is uh be to be able to adapt because i believe we all still remember the thing when we had to learn to adapt very fast and it was just three years ago during the beginning of covid 19. The first step is monitoring and evaluation and what is uh, important to remember in the process of uh, South-South cooperation that this, we need to avoid uh, typical North-South cooperation, monitoring and evaluation process and need to concentrate on South-South. And last but not least, it's uh, knowledge and information management, uh, which this, uh, can be described in dissemination of good practices and uh, further uh, giving them, readapting them. So, a little bit more training for cards. So, have participatory monitoring and evaluation process, yes or no? Disseminate knowledge to a restricted group of stakeholders. Implementation should be a horizontal learning process for all. Project design should emphasize participatory process. Transform a traditional North-South project into South-South project. It's up to the partners to identify the challenges and the areas of opportunity. Create communities to facilitate the transfer of information and communication. Do not consider sensitive cultural contexts. Make the evaluation with consultants who apply North-South approach. Yes? No. Call the actors involved, donors or recipients. No. Design the project without consultation with the constituents and other key actors. The inclusion of the tripartite partners is the utmost importance. A low review during the course of the project. Call the actors involved partners for development. Perfect. I'm really proud of you. <laughs> so. Uh, the SSTC enables the ILO to take advantage of their experience and knowledge of its constituents to answer their main question, how to promote decent work. Uh, ILO does it through capacity building, knowledge sharing, partnerships, networking, and knowledge platform. Oops, sorry. Yeah, the favorite, favorite picture of Cal. <laughs> so... ILO acts as a mediator, agent of systematization, dissemination of knowledge, alliance builder, and analyst of South-South and jungle cooperation. Uh, for this, we you can this on the diagram, uh, different tools and um, mechanisms we use to promote South-South jungle cooperation among one scholarships, training of trainers, and uh, you may see here in traditional workshops we are really glad to welcome you all today. Uh, also in this, I would like to show you one platform we are using for uh, promotion the South-South cooperation, what we do as ILO, where you can learn themes and find the relevant for you international labor standards and other interesting thematic topics you will be able to work with. Uh, and last but not least, it's opportunities for employers and uh, workers organizations. Uh, on the one hand, social partners from Global South can exchange with the peer learning from their many experiences of participation in elaboration of the United Nations Cooperation Framework for Sustainable Development and of Common Country Assessment. Uh, on the other hand, social partners can establish broader and more effective South-South cooperation networks involving all actors mentioned in previous chapters. Uh, who advocate for decent work and the 2030 agenda, like governments, NGOs, IFIs, and others. 
So this is in a nutshell all I would like to tell you today about the 23rd agenda and uh, getting back to Cal about Fantastic. our activity. Ta um, Tanya, did you want to add a few comments? Just, just very quickly. I just, I don't want. Can ah, you just ah, okay? You yes, just uh, uh, because um, I just wanted to say that uh, first. <laughs> okay, because you showed the um, the platform. This one, I will go back to the. Uh... So that just to mention that this platform uh, is available to you. Um, so you can access uh, your what are your <laughs> about the picture yes why <laughs> okay i just wanted to know that to say that it's available so you have access uh if you want to learn more as um Anastasia uh, mentioned uh and maybe just to um say that uh, you have been uh starting working on the SSTC way since last uh, last week and this morning the dialogue the inter the inter well the dialogue and the, when you were talking about uh, uh, your um, challenges and and um, uh, in your countries difference well you have similarity but at the same time you have your own uh, national context. And I think that uh, these uh, conversations, this interaction you had this morning and you will have around these two days uh, will, be very, will be very fruitful for you. Uh, and uh, yes, I just wanted to add this uh, and to say that it was very interesting to listen to you this morning. It, was, it has been a while that since I have been in the, in the tripartite uh, discussion like that. Uh, and it was very interesting. So just to mention that. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Tanya. And um, Nancy, just before we head to the exercise that we're going to do in smaller groups. Yes. Uh, just before we head in, I, I, had, a, I had a question. And I, I'm bringing this question over from our online workshop. So in our online workshop, someone asked, can we submit our own good practices to the platform? Yes, the answer, of course, is yes. Uh, Moreover, I can uh, tell you that uh, every biennium with ILO is working in uh, biennium terms. So uh, every two years, we collect all good practices from uh, our SSTC projects, and we later publish them uh, in uh, on our site, the, the site we have shown you, our platform. Uh, you, we will, of course, share with you the link to the previous biennium good practices, and we have also form to, to be filled in. And if you have to share something, please uh, share with us. And of course, it will be published uh, later when we will finalize and, uh, and compose them all together. Okay, so that form is important for your country to become famous for its good practices. Great. Um, do you want to introduce us to the exercise we're going to do? Yes. yes. Uh, and now let's, uh, we, a little bit more activity and practice. Uh, we have uh, SSTC activity, which is called World Cafe. We have three tables. Uh, so I suggest our, us, our team now divide into three groups and it's preferable to be from all different from all three countries uh, at the one table and we will uh, discuss a few questions quite simple questions uh, like what experience you already have how we can help each other and uh, what we can do what we can learn from each other and uh, we will look at this from the south south perspective from ILC, ILS perspective and from a uh, national perspective. So with this, Tanya and uh, Carl will help me. Can I to... can I randomize the group? So let's randomize the groups first. Okay. I'm going to give everyone a number and then and then we can have this discussion. So one, two, three, 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 one, two. Three, one, two, three, one. No, you're not. No, two. There, there we go. So remember your number. Table one is going to be this table right here. Oh, yeah, you folks back there. Uh, one, two, three. All right. So, so this is going to be table one, this big table here. Table two is going to be this big table here. 
and table three is is this table here. Okay. Uh, so so tell us again what we need to do. We need to answer all together to the questions. Like, what do we have? These yes. three questions. What experience do you have? What can you learn from other countries? What can you do together? Okay. And just a quick reminder, we will move as facilitators, me, Carl, and Tanya, we will move from table to table. You will have seven minutes to discuss before we change. Okay? Let's go. A table one here, table two here, table three here. If you need extra chairs, you can go grab them. And all of my friends... Sisters and brothers, I, I like to draw your attention, please. Uh, from group number one, uh, we were there from all three countries. So we have shared our experiences and some of the observations that I would like to share with all of you now. Uh, ILS, as far as concerned, uh, we have different experiences from different countries. Like our Bangladeshi experience is not as, as well as Nepal. There are some differences. For example, Nepal has not ratified all ILO, basic ILO conventions. Uh, but the thing is they have covered these ILO conventions in their law and constitution. So, so they are covering uh, the, 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 the main uh, philosophical aspect of those ILO, uh, I, standards, and then uh, uh, and then uh, constitutional provi uh, provisions and laws are there, but they know very little about human right due diligence. So they are very interested to learn about this and uh, a responsible business uh, hub, yeah, and then. Uh, in some of the countries like Bangladesh, the implementation is not as expected. It is a very lo lower level uh, implementation. We, though we have uh, ratified almost all the con uh, uh, fundamental conventions, including uh, uh, 36 conventions, including 87 and 98. And the second uh, uh, question is, uh, 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 no HRDD, uh, uh, no HRDD, uh, uh, no, we have our HRDD practices, we have started in, in Bangladesh. It practices means the process started. We are discussing, we are working together with the government and other, uh, uh, the, the employer side. But this HRDD experiences the other countries, especially Nepal, they want to learn from us how we are doing that, how we are handling these HRDD issues. And, uh, uh, and uh, Vietnam uh, can learn also uh, uh, from uh, freedom of association, collective bargaining uh, in the informal sector, how Nepal and Bangladesh is dealing with the informal sector uh, regarding this uh, collective bargaining and freedom of association. And number three is uh, what our suggestion, we need joint effort. We uh, propose for joint effort uh, for awareness building on HRDD at all level. And then uh, technical support for uh, development uh, uh, for uh, development culture. Uh, okay, co conditions. And then uh, regular sharing. We need sort of regular sharing in between the countries. And we need some networking. Through networking, we will develop our capacity and also our experiences sharing, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, yes, and uh, Vietnam, they have some MOU by which they can practice the ILO, uh, ILSS in their country through MOU. This is one of the good example that we can learn from them for the other countries. MOU uh, uh, for collective bargaining and uh, freedom of association. MOU, that's a tripartite uh, a document which they can they can use for for yeah yeah for union formation etc etc yeah thank you thank you so much excellent thank you to group number one let's he now head to group number two Nancy is going to speak yes group thank number you two. because like my my group decided that I will represent us uh, 
Well, uh, we had a very vivid discussions and uh, looking from the perspective of uh, South South and general cooperation, how we work together, how we can contribute together. Uh, and uh, well, that, well, we have heard, you may see two pages of uh, different ideas. And um, uh, I may confess that this was really interesting to hear. Uh, the main idea was that uh, in, in the framework of today's workshop, uh, Bangladesh and Nepal representatives are learning from Vietnam experience, learning from, because as uh, already graduated uh, from LDC uh, uh, status. And uh, we discussed that this, uh, we, try, we should get as more as possible from this workshop, but not limited to. So the further cooperation is very important. We also can learn from Bangladesh uh, experience of uh, safety, uh, the workspace uh, to mention. And uh, we also mentioned that for the future, uh, it's very um, it's important to um, organize study tours in the framework, not again, only not regional, but also inter-regional to learn from on, not only from countries in uh, Asian Pacific region, but from some Americas or African countries. And we also we also uh, said that th this is important to share not only uh, good practices but also some bottlenecks, some problems we get, uh, difficulties, and which is also very important to share. We also we encourage you to share good practices with us, but this is important to share not only with us as ILO but between each other, uh, not limited to the country and to the region. Uh, and we. Also, last but not least, I would mention uh, what we discussed in uh, the framework, that we should use different platforms for communication, for cooperation, all the possible. So it's gr great when I organize something for uh, tripartite constituents, but it's very, also very good to use any uh, possible uh, option as like as G20, United Nations, uh, international financial organizations, and others. Thank you, Carl, over to you. Thank you. And then uh, last but not least, group three. Thank you. Uh, as you can see here uh, in our table, we have discussed our, our experiences, learning and uh, do things that we are going to like supposed to do together. Uh, as the experiences are like no experiences are being shared, that means, and uh, do together things are like so many here, that means uh, it, proves that SSTC is, is like really relevant and it should be continued in the future. So uh, regarding the learning sections, uh, Vietnam wants to learn how to ratify convention number 87 because they have only one uh, trade union representatives in their country. And they also want to know how to handle and how to manage uh, the, the labor market, labor situations where there are so many trade, uh, so many labor organizations uh, in this case, we have such kind of experiences. We have 19 trade union federations at the national levels. And in Nepal, they have formed one coordination committee, joint trade union uh, coordination committee. And uh, they collectively bargain with the government. So government deals with only ZUCC uh, regarding the labor's voice. That's uh, quite simple enough for the Vietnam. If you want to learn more, you can uh, visit the website for the ZUCC of Nepal. Uh, regarding Nepal wants to learn about the tribunals uh, uh, to settle the uh, collective bargaining disputes. So if you have any uh, experiences regarding the tribunals, as we have discussed in our online sessions also. So if you have any good practices and uh, uh, any experiences regarding the tribunals, uh, please kindly share it to the forum. And Bangladesh, uh, wants to know more about uh, tripartite TCC. Uh, they wants to know more who, who has it and uh, learn uh, the legal framework for the C-190, convention number 190. And Bangladesh and Nepal, they jointly want to know more about the trade unions and, uh, and their like uh, roles in the informal and the uh, domestic sectors. Uh, I think I have shown the time card, one, one minute left. I'll, uh, move to do together things. There are so many things uh, to do together. Uh, we have like just Nepal just uh, implemented the national action plan on formalization. We have many things to share and uh, on that action plan, we are trying to uh, establish a regional network for formalization. So this forum 
maybe the, this SSTC will definitely help uh, in that regard. So there are so many things to do together, like we can make a forum uh, and we can work together. Uh, with this, I will let's stop here. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Let's give him a hand. I think one of the I think one of the things that was uh, especially interesting about table group three is there's also a lot of talk about the three countries banding together to the all of the conversations around the three countries banding together to um, try to negotiate things, extension of GSP uh, plus and and uh, um, how to deal also with India and China, which are sort of major uh, players in this space. We are uh, going to now head to lunch. So thank you all for uh, doing this uh, uh, sharing, this initial sharing. And yes. Oh, you're, you're happy that we're doing lunch. Good. <laughs> I think we all are, right? We're going to head to lunch. Um, let me tell you about what's going to happen in the afternoon. The af this afternoon is going to be much more focused on group work. Some of the group work is going to be amongst your countries. So that's the country goal uh, setting. And some of that work is going to be around building this collaborative mission. So we're already starting to hear some interesting opportunities for working together. What could it look like, right? If we were to, you know, play this out a little bit more and, and talk about, you know, maybe what are some of the activities that we could do um, if we were to pursue some of these opportunities. So those are going to be the two big things this afternoon. Um, I need to tell you what's happening with lunch and it's on the fourth floor. Is it the restaurant? It's one hour. So we will come back at uh, two o'clock, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, two o'clock. Thank you all for your song recommendations. Um, I can see potentially, we have the potential to do like a, a karaoke talent night, especially with our uh, Bangladesh <laughs> colleagues here. Um, you're going to really challenge us to, we'll see how many of these songs we can find online, but we're going to put together, as much as possible, we're going to put together a playlist based on this, and you'll hear this uh, hopefully starting this afternoon. So, excellent. Let's talk a little bit about what we're going to be doing this. Oh, actually, before I, I go to talk about what we're going to be doing this afternoon, I also wanted to say that uh, myself or Yara will be to, taking photos of you because we're going to make a wall of fame with all of you folks on it. And what we're going to ask you to do to add to that wall of fame once we take a photo is a work interest and a hobby of yours, right? So something not work-related, but let, what's something that is a work interest of yours is particularly related to ILS? And what is a, a hobby of yours? And we're going to put up that onto a wall. So if Yara comes to you asking you for a photo, you will know why. Um, let's talk a little bit about this afternoon. So we have two things that we're going to do this afternoon before the end of the day. One is we're going to do a little bit of country goal setting. So we've talked a lot about different areas that are of interest for the different countries. Now on your tables, on each of your tables, there is a canvas that is going to be a structured way for us to identify what are some of the areas that you are most interested in uh, making progress in, right? So, so to, pull, to identify some of those, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about how we're going to do that. And then we're going to look, we're gonna have a new poster and it will it will provide us a structured approach to develop our missions, our collaborative missions, right? So how, what are some of the different areas in which we might work together and what we might do, how we might work together um, in each of those areas? So that's, that's where we're going to go. Um, before we go into the country goal setting, I want to share seven different opportunities for collaboration that have come up, right? Because this could potentially influence some of the goals that that you have, or at least, you know, shape some of your thinking around the goals that you have. Each of these seven opportunities is something that we heard from multiple countries uh, during the course of the consultations that we did, as well as the uh, uh, workshop uh, that we did. Okay, so let's take a look at the seven of them. The first one is experience sharing on establishing labor dispute resolution mechanisms. Uh, I think in, in the workshop, we heard you know Nepal's interest on tribunals uh, and that there were some possibilities of uh, exchanges around that. That's number one. Number two, formalizing the informal economy and integrating international labor standards. Number three, improving conditions in the garment sector and specifically with a focus on attracting greater uh, trade and investment. Number four, promoting labor migration protections, all three countries uh, in different ways. Number five, 
leveraging ILS to increase market access and investment more generally. So, so what are some things that we can learn about better um, accessing uh, markets, especially related to GSP plus? Uh, number six is uh, increasing gender equality through ILS. And number seven is labor law reform and legislative compliance with ILO conventions. Uh, there might be more, right? There are probably more, but these were seven that we heard over the course of the conversations that we had leading up to today's workshop. Uh, I think this workshop, we've already have ha added maybe a, a few things in there, but I just wanted to share this with you because it can help maybe uh, uh, sort some of your thinking about what are some of the areas that each of your countries right, might want to focus on as we do the activities uh, later this afternoon. Any questions or comments about this? You get to choose, right, what you, what you want to do. Uh, yes. Uh, I have one wonder. That is, uh, while well, talking about the gender, uh, we had a session, but no discussion. And participation is also very poor. And uh, here is also missing that thing. And uh, two, two, two agenda, actually. One is a structured uh, gender pay gap. In my country, those positions who, uh, which are less paid are made for women, only women. Gender pay gap is not there, but there are some low paid positions in which only women are uh, kept. And uh, maybe same in other parts also. And I'm wondering, <laughs> this is first wonder. Second wonder, uh, our women participants are keeping silent here. Why this happens? Are we leaving that agenda from this SSTC? It's my question, big question. Okay. So, so two things to, to think on. Yes. Actually, here are a lot of a lot of areas of the uh, the considering uh, yeah considering issues and these are the seven area. But beyond that, I think most important OSS it's occupational safety and health. It is most important, and we should consider in this year also. Occupational safety. Yeah. Okay. That's a good one. Any anything our um, anything our women participants want to add to the conversation? No. Okay. okay thank you. Actually, the, I I expected that there might be any suggestion how this in this region the living wise is being ensured. But uh, I don't uh, find any suggestion from this. Did you? Is there any missing point? <laughs> Thank you. Living oils. Living minimum oils. Living minimum oils. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. I'm going to just uh, uh, write these down. But so we've got. We've got Osh. Osh. And we've got living wage. Minimum wage. I, I think that that has come up, but it has come up primarily in the context of formalization. I've, I've heard it in the context of formalization in the previous conversations. Anything anyone else wants to add? Hold on, hold on. Inclusive. Inclusive development and growth. In, uh, no, actually, it is related with uh, the. I think the country's perspectives, and when we think about uh, the overall countries, and then they, they it is essential that uh, we should consider the whole, uh, whole. I think in one box, yeah. Great, so inclusive development and growth. So I've got three additional ones based on what we've been talking about so far. Yes. Uh, in my opinion, I think it is uh, better to add on major issue of uh, social protection and social security. Uh, it is, I think, uh, social, it is one of the pillar of decent work. I think it is better to add this. Okay, 
social protection. So I, I think this this is very interesting, right? Because there's a lot, thank you. There's a lot that we can put under formalization and social protection, I've heard it under that context as well, but it can also sit separately, uh, social protection. Good, so I've got four, maybe, thank you. I've got four potential additional items on this. Yes. Responsible business and human right diligence. And this will be linked with the living wage as well, because it's one of the requirements in HRDD law. Coming this, uh, in, in coming this, HRDD is a very important uh, uh, issues. It will be uh, because of you know the German indigenous law and uh, European uh, law is coming in 2026. And of course, the European Green Deal is most important. Uh, when the European Green Deal will pass in their uh, parliament, it will be a very uh, uh, you know, uh, vital issue. So I think HRDD uh, could be an a issue that we can collaborate among us, uh, in Nepal, Vietnam, Bangladesh, and others. It, it, it is part of Green Deal, actually. It's a part of Green Deal and HRDD, everything. Thanks. Is that was that a hand? No, oh, right over here. Yes. Uh, I like to uh, input another one that is uh, responsible business and uh, protecting human rights uh, of the workers. Is it same? All right. So we've got agreement. This is good. Uh, I, I, I had another hand here. Was this separate? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll come to you folks. I'll come to you folks. I think uh, it has been covered by all the, I think, seven areas. But one suggestion I would like to echo with the voice of my Bangladeshi uh, partner, uh, that corporate sustainability due diligence directives, a new, I think, EU, uh, some set of conditions relating to labor rights, environment, and human rights. And also, there are in their uh, 32 convention, there are also issues of these uh, due, uh, due diligence issues. Uh, so uh, this should come in a separate, I think, uh, uh, heading so that it is uh, specifically discussed uh, with great focus because we are all the, I think uh, graduating LDCs are also uh, 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 having some sorts of challenges in meeting uh, their standards, these standards. And another uh, issue that I would like to add here uh, that uh, after graduation, yes, uh, we are going to have some FTS, uh, free trade agreements, uh, preferential trade agreements with our different key trading partners. So while engaging in negotiation because new generation FTA uh, requires some labor standards, human rights, due diligence, all these issues will have to cover. How uh, among us, uh, I think Vietnam has a very vast experiences of having such type of negotiation because the standard of the developed countries in terms of labor uh, human rights issues is uh, far different, far better than the uh, developing South. So how can we cope up with their requirements and what strategies and uh, I think uh, we should take uh, to actually uh, comply with their expectations. So these issues uh, should come up in this discussion. Another issue is gender issues that uh, in our countries, especially uh, the uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, we have uh, proximity, cultural proximity, uh, natural proximity. And so uh, I, I don't know about the Vietnam. So our women, uh, our, our women, they, contribute lots in family war, domestic war, rearing children, and also uh, adding nutrition and value to the families. But their, their contribution remain unpaid and unrecognized in our national accounting system. How uh, this can be brought up in the greater ILO agenda so that 
uh, their contribution, even not recognized, but uh, to the national accounting system, to the GDP and to the uh, international growth system, how it can be, I think, linked. So these issues. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. And I've got a few last hands over here. Just very brief, two points are there we can consider. Uh, one is uh, the collective bargaining and a social dialogue system to, to promote and to ensure these two points. And the second point is uh, climate change and, uh, and just transition. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Was there another hand here or is that covered already? Same thing. Okay. Okay. So we've got lots of ideas for potential areas of priority. Um, I'm not going to add them to the slide because well, it'll take too long to add them to the slide right now, but I, I do want to explain a little bit about how we'll do this next piece. So this next piece, you're going to sit in country groups. I think most of you are already uh, doing that. And you'll see that on that canvas that you have, there are four questions, right? One is, What's the goal, right? So, so if you are um, uh, looking to create progress in some area or there's a challenge that you're looking to solve, what's the goal? The goal is not to have an exchange with another country, right? That's a means to, to achieve something. The goal is what are you trying to achieve for um, your country, right? What are uh, specific sectors or industries that you're looking to grow? Or maybe what are areas where you're looking to advance inclusive economic growth? So for example, right, if I were to fill this in, I could say, you know what, maybe we want higher value added in the garment industry, right? So so we want to um, get out of some of the more uh, low uh, low value added uh, uh, sort of markets. We want to get into higher value added for the garment industry. And maybe we also want social protection, right? We want to build up a social protection system uh, uh, or a, a sort of eligibility for our garment workers. That's number one. Number two is how does it connect to your national priorities? So this would be government policies, government strategies, announcements that, you know, that have been made. Uh, uh, it could also be sort of priorities and strategies of some of the other uh, social partners here. But I want it to connect to how does this connect to your national priorities? Is there a question over here? It could be migrant workers, but but I'm not asking you to answer this right now. I'm just explaining. <laughs> yes, so it could be migrant workers, right? So how does it connect to national priorities? Maybe uh, your country has a, a national industrialization strategy, right? Or something like that, right? What are some of the policies that it connects to? Next, how could your goal benefit from normative approaches? So we're here because we're having a discussion about how to leverage ILS, right? Uh, so this is the piece where we know what are some of the applicable conventions, what are some of the benefits, right? So maybe GSP plus, right? Expand market access to some more premium uh, 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 markets or sellers. Maybe we wanna encourage producers to move away from low quality production, right? So there's an industry, industrial development goal there. Um, and then what are some of the applicable uh, conventions? And then lastly is what is challenging or what is needed? And the reason I put this up is because if you're going to find places to work with other countries, then there are probably questions, things that you want to learn from those other countries or things that you would want to do potentially collaboratively with those other countries, right? So, so what, so, um, here, right, I could say, well, you know, we want to learn more about approaches to formalizing the garment industry. Is there work that's already happening? Can we learn from other countries about these approaches? What are good practices for social protection systems for semi-formalized work, right? Is anyone doing some interesting work in this area that we could learn from? What I have written here is an example, right, just to help you kind of understand how you could add to this. Uh, and now that I've explained the example, I can take questions. Yes. So right over here. I'd like to add, add some point here. What kind of point? Tell me. The, uh, what please. Kind of point? Yeah? Uh, automation, robotization, and uh, artificial intelligence, and migration and RMG sector. The, uh, this should be their priority. RMG. The, ah, ah, yes. Automation. Automation is a very important issue because large number of workers large number of people are losing job due to 
uh, automation my, uh, and artificial intelligent migration. I guess, sorry, uh, robotization. Uh, hmm. yeah. so, so this is very interesting because, yeah, fourth industrial revolution. Yes. So, so this is very interesting, right? Because the comment here is, we don't just need to think about the situation right now. We need to think about the automation, the robotization, the introduction of chat GPT and other things. How are those going to affect our workers over the next five years, right? So this is also maybe an area for us to be exploring. To, it will all affect every country here, right? That That's one certainty. We just don't know how exactly it will affect the country. So so great, uh, great suggestion and something for us to think about. Were there any questions about this framework? Because we're going to start some discussion. Now we're going to move into group discussions. And you'll see, you'll see on it, I'm just going to borrow yours. You'll see on it, there are three rows, right? So you've got space to identify three kind of priority. You won't be able to work on all of your priorities during the workshop, sorry. Um, <laughs> but you've got space for three priorities that, that you can identify uh, as a group. Any questions? Okay. So I'm going to give you folks about um, I'm going to give you folks about 40 minutes. Yeah, we'll give you about 40 minutes as a group. Fill this out. Up to three. You can have less than three if you want, but up to three uh, priority areas. And then we're going to do a little bit of sharing after that. Okay. Okay. Here we are. So. Uh, Nancy mentioned that uh, uh, I love this slide. I'm going to come back to it in a moment. But before that, what I want to do is I want to invite Tanya up to tell us a little bit about Tanya had a look at Tanya and Nancy actually had a look at the goals that you had. And, and she has put some thinking into what are some possible groupings that could happen. And so as Tanya tells you about these groupings, I want you to think about which one you would like to work on first. You'll have the op option to work on two of them, right? But which of these groups would you want to work on first? That'll be the one that we'll work on today, and then we'll do another one tomorrow. So have a have a listen to uh, kind of how Tanya has thought about where the overlaps might be between your goals, and then think about which one you would like to start with today. Thank you, Cal. So in total, we had uh, nine goals, three per uh, three goals per uh, per group. And we came up with uh, four uh, groups, four goals. Um, the first, well, the first, not the first one, but we have one on social security protection. Uh, two countries, uh, as uh, I've talked, well, I've mentioned it in the um, after discussing the the, the issue. Uh, the other uh, uh, topic that we had more actually countries is freedom of association well we 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 joined a lot of, of things so freedom of association and trade as well as um labor dispute so it the three the three issue goes to uh, uh, go together and then we have a uh, climate and we have another group uh, climate change we have another group uh, with uh, skills and migrant uh, skills because uh, Nepal talk about uh, human resource development and retention, and and we join it with uh, with migrant workers. So it's the four group that we came up uh, with the nine nine goal we had. I hope it's fine for you. Yes, thank you. Yes, thanks, Tanya. So you will have the opportunity to shape a little bit more what goes in and 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 what actually that group could potentially work on. That's going to be the next step. What I'm going to do is I want to explain a little bit about how we're going to do that, right? So now we've got a new poster that's coming up and you'll see here that at the top it says stakeholder and country, right? So what this means is that you don't have to have everyone from let's say Bangladesh go and work on only one group now, right? You could have the workers and and the you know uh, government for example go work in different groups if you have different interests that's okay right but you're going to have the stakeholder and country and we've got three of them here right so what this means is you're going to bring over the goals 
from each of your uh, pr your previous exercise. You're going to bring them up here, right? So um, I already talked about this, right? Higher value added in the garment industry, for example, and social protection for garment workers. And you're also going to bring out these two answers, right? These are things you have already answered. But what we want to do is within a group that you're where you're doing some kind of collaboration. So for example, on climate, we want to bring together those post-its, right? So let's say we've got two stakeholders that are coming together from different countries. One of them is looking at social protection. The other one is looking at formalizing the informal garment industry. Great. This is all things that you've already answered. But the next piece is we we'll already have what is challenging, what is needed. What could we do together, right? This is going to be a brainstorm where your group is going to think about, we're both looking to achieve these similar goals. Is there something we could do together? What is the overlap between the interests? What kinds of collaborations could we potentially pursue together? So for example, here, um, maybe this group said, we wanna do joint research and policy exchanges on formalization and social protection, right? So we want to do some research together to look at what are some of the approaches out there, right? And then how could we do it together, right? So, so what are some of the activities? Well, we could apply, establish a joint research team potentially. I mean, this is a proposal, by the way, we're not committing to anything, right? But this is one idea about how we could do it, establish a joint research team. We could have joint study visits to countries that have established um, social relevant social protection systems. And then the last piece, which is here, is how could each country contribute to that collaboration, right? So are there, you know, um, in the online training, for example, we heard from Vietnam had already conducted some research on tribunals, right? Fantastic. Um, that's something that you can already contribute to a, a collaboration on that topic. So this is the poster that you're going to put together. And you can see there's there's three columns. So you have three potential uh, stakeholders that can come together to, to look at a collaboration. It doesn't have to be three. It could be two. Right, you can have a collaboration between two people just as much as you can have three, maybe even more. Right, let's say you have more. Let us know. We'll, we'll get you a second uh, uh, a poster. Right. So we're going to assemble this, and I just wanted to share. I want to come back to this because this slide contains how you can collaborate. All of the different ideas we printed this out, so you you can take a photo of it. But there's also a copy of this on each of your tables. And Nancy, I've expanded a little. I liked your slide so much. I expanded on it a little bit. So um, obviously, you know, capacity building. You've got scholarship. You can have a training of the trainers, assigning experts on different areas, um, exchanging experiences and best practices. You could share research findings, kind of like what uh, Vietnam was proposing. Uh, establishment of partnerships and mobilization, uh, sorry, partnerships and alliances. You have joint resource mobilization. So Johnny this morning was talking about uh, how a number of countries have feminist foreign policies and they're looking to invest in these spaces, right? Maybe this is an area we could do joint resource mobilization, apprenticeships, joint research for policy development, establishment of standards. Maybe we're looking at what are some common standards that we can do, regional agreements, joint development of portals and platforms. Maybe we're sharing information or we're doing, you know, we're building something together, right? Um, and then lastly, creation and strengthening of networks and platforms. So you have international workshops and platforms like and forums like this one, which is going to be a platform, communities of practice, maybe even establishing a joint center of excellence, right? That is doing uh, work in these spaces. So these are all just ideas, right, of how you can do joint something jointly or together or do some kind of exchange. So this is printed and it's on each of your tables uh, uh, as you do this, right? So I've shared I, I've shared this framework here. No, we're not there yet. And I want to just ask if anyone has any questions about the framework so far. Or anything you're curious about or you're wondering about on the framework. This framework will help different groups come together and find what are the areas where they could work to how they could work together. If not, here's what we're going to do. So the next piece is now we need to figure out what you want to work on, right? What's the topic you want to work on together? So Tanya mentioned uh, four areas, right, Tanya? Um, and depending on which of these areas you're interested in, you're going to come over to a section of the room, right? So uh, we've got one group here on climate. So if you're interested in climate, come over here. If you are, you can stay for now, I'll read them all and then you can decide where to go, right? We've got one on skills 
and migration, right? That's another one right here. And then, oh, we put these so far away from each other. <sighs> we have one on freedom of association, trade, and labor disputes. And then we have one on social security protection, right? So these are the four groups where there's a, a lot of space for working together. And the question is, which one do you want to work on first? You'll have the chance to work on two of them, but which one do you want to work on first? So I'm going to invite everyone to stand up and go to the one that you are most interested in. So, so that it can be a combined pressure put on the buyers or it can work as a caucus. For an example, uh, in ILO, GB, and ILS, these countries can form a caucus, a caucus so that they can, they can have a separate side meeting so they can uh, play a synchronized role in bigger forums. It's like that. And uh, so we have also uh, like exchange of views on uh, Convention 87 for because this involves the interest of all the three countries because we need to get access in the uh, European market. So there should, can be a common strategy formed uh, through the understanding and uh, learning from the other country. So this would be joint capacity building and training. So these are the things that we have come up with. And uh, if you have anything to uh, for further clarification or any specific uh, issue raised to a uh, directed to any particular country, we can come up with. We can. Thank you. Did anyone else from the group want to add anything? Does anyone have any questions or feedback for this group? Yeah. I was in another group. Um, I don't know who represented from Nepal, but uh, okay. Uh, it's okay because I was uh, missing trade union representation from my country. Because uh, when we talk about freedom of association, that is not uh, enterprises association. It, these are workers associations freedom. And in that, if we can uh, work together better, then we all can be benefited. We have many more agenda on freedom of association in this part. Like multi-unionism is there. Some countries have national level uh, centers to dialogue with government. Uh, collective bargaining centers are in national level, like Nepal. We, we decide minimum wage and different standards in the national level. But some countries may not have that type of things and only in the enterprises level. So that type of experiences, multi-unionism is, there is freedom of associations. But that practice in Nepal we are doing is somehow it is threatening uh, the rights uh, with that of rights itself. For example, we have, maybe I take long, a very typical example we have. Uh, we have JTUCC, that is uh, National Center of Trade Unions. We, ha we have nine or 10 members there. And some nine or 10 members are not in JTUCC, but they are federations. My friend was saying 20 or 19 altogether. 19. So when when we we go on uh, debating or we have our position with government, then government may choose other, they, they are made some paper unions or paper federations in, in their country. Yeah, that type of issues are we are facing with, if so. Is, is there a suggestion? Excuse me. Uh, I have I have some. Add one about yeah. sharing the uh, freedom of associations practices in our country. Okay. But uh, I would like to say that, perfect. meanwhile, uh, so far I uh, know, uh, except Bangladesh, uh, ILO Convention 87 and 98 has yet to uh, ratify it by the two countries. That's why. We can uh, share our experience. How? What is what is the strategy, and how we implement it, and we compel the government to ratify this ILO Convention 87 and 98. Uh, and that's why we can we can uh, and 
and we can also take um, some experience from them without uh, freedom of, of uh, without 87 and 98 how they are proceeding and um, uh, making dialogue and uh, realizing the benefit of the work workers uh, to, protect. Uh, how, how to protect the workers right and uh, we can exchange our views hmm. that uh, the, the, all the details are coming here but I think besides we, uh, we, we should think about the freedom associated with the trade union. And trade union should have the function of just like they have uh, protect the right of themselves. They should have uh, the uh, work on the protect of the uh, industry and the factory uh, for the well-being of the whole uh, uh, employer and employer. And and uh, and they they uh, the, the systemic approach. They should think uh, the systemic approach with the systemic approach and strengthening the uh, capacity of the uh, factory industries and enterprises as well as uh, the well-being of the themselves. And in these perspectives, I think how far we are thinking here, uh, we should uh, know about it. Yeah. Suggestion for the collaboration. Collaboration, yeah. That should have the collaboration with uh, uh, the employee or a trade union collaboration, direct collaboration, indirect collaboration with the employer too. Uh, it is only for well-being of the uh, the uh, well-being of the whole industries. Yeah, uh, whole industries means that uh, parts and partially uh, employee are there, and the industries are there and their capital are there, their land are there, and all the resources are there. And the protection and well-being for the uh, whole resources would be there. Thank you. Did you want to? Uh, first of all, there isn't any hard and fast rule like formal learning teaching. Like the, the issues that from the two our Nepali colleagues that we have come to know is uh, something which is itself the process of learning so in the process of ratifying uh, convention 87 there would be issues and uh, situations which are to be very which would be very much country specific so in a particular country that would be unique so in doing that so what the what are the things that we have faced so our counterpart can share and from that you can have some ideas but again it has to be your own way of mechanism uh, and uh, pressurizing your government and taking everybody on board and coming towards uh, the final goal. So we can contribute to each other's well-being by understanding, sharing, and caring. Uh, but at the same time, it will also give you some ideas and, uh, and uh, uh, insights about these. So uh, And uh, sharing a common platform would like uh, build the confidence, boost your uh, confidence so that you could come up forward uh, in this regard. So that's up to now. We can all hope for the best. Uh, comment from Reiko. Yeah. Um, yeah. If we are to, for example, take this further, you know, like do a follow up. Is there any other other countries that you would like to learn from or it is what you've got here sort of? Any of that? Any I mean, I guess it also. Yeah, anyone yeah. can answer that. Countries you'd like. The, there is uh, the trade union. The practice of the trading is uh, uh, different country has different system. Just Bangladesh and Nepal are the same. And there is the Vietnam. And the scenario of the Vietnam is different. And we should learn from the Vietnam. And we should learn, uh, Vietnam also should learn from uh, the Bangladesh and Nepal. Uh, this kinds of because I think that is a uh, uh, the narrow narrow space of the trade union in uh, Vietnam, and we have Bangladesh and Nepal has good kinds of exercise of the trade unionism. Uh, more uh, yeah, more than good I think uh, because of I think some kinds of uh, some kinds of inability or so inability or so and some kinds of carteling or so some kinds of syndicate type of uh, things also they are prevailing in Nepal and and the Bangladesh, yeah. And that's why in between, we should have all kinds of solution we can we can search, search for, yeah? Okay. Oh, 
for an example, not as a presenter, just as a country. So we have seen and identified like in terms of insurance, we have some seen some good examples in Indonesia. So in terms of uh, trade union registration and simplification of the process, we have seen some good examples in Malaysia. So it's not about like um, what I should say. So keeping the options open. So whenever there is a good practice in any part of the globe, that can be shared and that can be shared through a third country as well. So it is a only matter of learning about something and adopting that in our country in our contextual way. So that's the thing. Last comment. I would like to say we have gathered uh, trade in, uh, tripartite uh, co committee like uh, uh, management, government, and employer and trade union. But I would like to say not only three countries. What you have told right now that another other other countries should be incorporated to share to ex uh, to say, exchange our views and experiences so that we can boost up our knowledge. That's that's why I think I think the India and other uh, 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 Indonesia, Malaysia uh, should be incorporated with our um, this, this type of in the board. We, they should brought in the board. Yeah. I think. Okay. Yeah, All right, folks. Let's head over to our next group. We are ho going over to skills and migration which is also a group that all three i keep tripping over that too um there is a group that all three countries are participating in so come and join us on skills and migration who will be sharing for skills and migration huh very good let me let me just wait for the group to come together yes everyone's a welcome to contribute can I invite everyone over to skills and migration? Our colleagues from Vietnam. Come on, come on over. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Welcome to the last presentation. So, no shopping? No contribution to the Thailand economy. Okay. Okay. Uh, welcome uh, from this group. This group is for skilly, skills and migration, which is very important, especially a country like Bangladesh, Nepal, and also for Vietnam. Uh, as you know, that uh, more than 13 million people from only from Bangladesh are now migrated. And migration income is the second highest income for Bangladesh. And for Nepal, I think, is it second? Maybe something like this. OK. Uh, uh, so we are here, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Vietnam. And uh, let me uh, share something about our country goal. Uh, the country goal is the increase our income, foreign currency income remittance which is a public remittance and then uh, uh, then uh, uh, increase employment so 13 million people employment is very high for bangladesh where we have our you know unemployment is a very big crisis in bangladesh and nepal too uh, then <clears throat> uh, protection of labor rights then uh, uh, increase the livelihood of the working people, then promote just migration. Not only migration, it must be quality migration. Uh, and skill promotion, et cetera, et cetera. These are from the uh, countries as a whole. Then let me share about what is the challenges and what is needed. Then uh, unskilled, Workers are one of the big challenge. Then skill recognition framework is a very uh, lack of uh, framework. And then uh, uh, then uh, skill, skilling problem. Uh, then policies and programs for uh, returning uh, migrant workers. <laughs> and then also uh, <clears throat> lack of skills. Uh, then uh, reintegration again, then policy gap 
for migration. Upskilling and reskilling is one of the problems. Then policy framework and uh, economic mainstreaming while they are returning. Uh, it is another big problem nowadays that they, when they are coming back, they cannot actually mainstream in the economic uh, economic mainstream and also social mainstreaming. There are a lot of problems in social mainstreaming. Uh, this is another problem. So skilled labor is another challenge and uh, uneducated people uh, uh, who are migrated. <clears throat> Unskilled is in terms of everything. Of course, not only uh, the language, it is the language gap, the social gap, the food uh, habit gap. There are many things, legal, everything. So there are many things covered. So as a whole, actually, what could we do together? Uh, here, policy framework, and then a digital platform. We can create some digital platform together. And uh, uh, then uh, uh, systematic knowledge sharing and uh, prior recognition of skills, uh, which is not for a single country. So all the sending and receiving country, we have to have sort of system where the uh, there will be skill recognition so that uh, the good place it will be there. especially for Bangladesh you know our workers are earning the lowest in the world even even uh, we, if we can increase our income average the, it will uh, contribute a lot in our economy <laughs> and then how could we do together uh, establishing a digital platform it will be accessible for all the countries, all the all the migrant workers, especially also the potential workers, not only the workers, also the potential workers, so that they can also share, they can also get some information, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Uh, and they can get information even for the uh, 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 receiving countries, uh, their laws, their systems, their employment, everything, and then digital platform, then oh, another sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Capacity building. Capacity building is for the uh, trade unions, for the other uh, civil society organizations who are also the players. And I will say that also from the government side, they need also sort of, you know, uh, capacity building to address this very crucial issue. This issue is not only in the sending country. This is also, we have our our, for example, our uh, embassies, our diplomatic, uh, you know, points in the destination country where they can also contribute if they have much capacity. So this is one of the area that we can also think for together. And then, uh, uh, then uh, uh, recognition system, yeah. Consular service, I mentioned already because this is. Another problem, I was visiting Qatar last uh, six, seven months before. So I saw there the consular service is not really up to the mark. Even Bangladesh case is even worse than the other countries. As I have seen, I'm, I, I, have, I have to admit this. So we can also in, uh, uh, increase our capacity even in the destination country, our consular services. And uh, then database. Database means uh, the, the 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 workers, those who are leaving country and also coming back, so all the returnees and the uh, and the uh, migrant workers, they should have some sort of they should be included in the database where we will find their uh, whereabouts and everything, their skills, their ages, their uh, you know gender, everything should be can be covered uh, in this database. Uh, then. Uh, uh, MOUs, we can we can have sort of MOUs in between the sending countries. For example, uh, Nepal, Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, uh, Vietnam. We we for example, we will have some common understanding. Okay, on this on this point, we will stand 
unitedly, commonly. We will have our common interest. Definitely we have our common interest. So we will, if we have sort of, you know, understanding so that we can address those issues, not individually, we can address these issues commonly. Even I know, I saw in Qatar, uh, the GFON, they have their, uh, you know, uh, they have their people who is working on, on migration issues, but I don't have. So, so why not that the, 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 the G font will work for us? If we have sort of MOUs, then of course you can work for me, I can work for you, so we can work for us work together. So that is one of the point. Uh, we can help each other. And then, uh, uh, then a cooperation in between the trade unions to trade union. Uh, even some of the receiving country, even the Middle Eastern countries, uh, some of the countries we have our trade union, like Jordan, uh, like, uh, uh, no, no, not Kuwait, uh, Lebanon and some other countries, we have our trade union, uh, you know, colleagues, friends, organizations, Malaysia, Singapore. So we can uh, sort of, you know, mutual understanding in between the trade unions, trade union to trade union. So these are the areas that we can work together. We have some spaces, some rooms that we can think for. We can work together. And then uh, what might each country contribute uh, the collaboration? I think this is also, there are many things that we can also collaboratively work. But again, uh, we have, we can exchange our experiences because Bangladesh have sort of peculiar experiences. Uh, what are the situations for our domestic workers in Saudi Arabia? That can also I share with the other countries. And similarly, we can also learn from the other countries, even from Nepal. Because Nepal have sort of, you know, uh, good, ex good uh, experiences. They have some, uh, you know, uh, uh, good experiences that we can share, we can learn from them. So we, we, we will have some, you know, uh, a hub and uh, we, we can share our data. What we have established here, the data, database, we can also share. This is the situation in our country and we can also take their data for our analyzing, analyzing and also for our uh, uh, strategizing our programs. Then uh, uh, skill training. We have our framework, training framework. We can ha we, we have our, you know, uh, uh, we, we have our curricula. Yeah, we can, we can work together uh, on that. And then capacity building, we can collaborate each other, training, workshops, et cetera, et cetera, and publications too, and, and MOUs that we can also uh, 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 cooperate each other. Thank you so much. Was there any feedback or any questions on this? Yes, I'm going to start with you. Uh, thank you, brother, for your good presentation. Uh, uh, you, your presentation almost covered basically things uh, how to improve, uh, how to promote uh it, migration and the promotion of migration uh, everything i think it uh, one thing is missing uh we we do not want to promotion migrant workers we have to do with collaboration with our uh, uh employment entrepreneurship and self employed we have to do uh, with its oaks, it's missing, I think. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. Can I, can we just take all the questions together and then you uh, want to add something? Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, you have uh, already uh, covered many things. Uh, in the in regarding the challenging. So one is most important things is gap that is uh, information gap, country of origin and destination. 
uh, another things is uh, we can uh, uh, share other countries uh, like uh, Nepal. Uh, just uh, last month, uh, we have visited the uh, Dofe, Nepal. So they are uh, only, uh, they are working for the, uh, those are going to abroad, so how they have uh, registered and how they help. And if any complaint, um, anybody uh, from returning workers or uh, the, those are going to the abroad, so how they handling the case, the disputed case, uh, and some uh, 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 shelter center. We have also visited some shelter centers, so we can uh, uh, share this uh, also. Thank you. Okay. 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 Oh, sure. I think level should be updated, matching with the matching with the migrant workers' right uh, in I think in every country, particularly in three countries. Number one, number two, uh, human universal human universal human rights of the workers uh, in every countries, like in Middle East. What we see. The human rights violation is taking place. Massive human rights violation is taking place. But we cannot do anything because we have no, we cannot intervene and we cannot uh, combat because of uh, there are so many uh, barriers. Uh, what you have also mentioned in the in your report. That's why uh, we have to penetrate. We have to intervene. We have to facilitate to intervene. That that law should be facilitated. Uh, uh, okay. Thank you. When we talk about migration issue, most of the people take Jifon's name. First, I want to uh, add there about the ILS, about migration. Can't we work together what uh, ILO is mentioned for ILO standard, standards? Because on migration, they have very, I mean, progressive standards prepared. Second one is uh, for Jifon's story. We have one slogan made some 20 years back. There is wherever uh, workers, there are there is different. When our workers are migrated, then we, we have to meet them and organize them. We started. We did it together with other member, I mean, friend trade unions in destination countries. And where trade union, uh, union is not there, we, we seek behind ILO. In Qatar, we did it. And this year, we won alternative World Cup. When Messi was grabbing his World Cup, we were also grabbing. Our World Cup was for our works done in Qatar to protect the right of, rights of workers there. And now we have SSF, start, I mean, social security started for migrant workers. And so, uh, uh, we have, uh, we, we say GSG, different support groups in the, those countries. GSG works in line with their own rules and regulations. And they join in some countries, they have started to get membership from the destination countries, big trade unions. And uh, this year, uh, Malaysia is also starting to do this. So organizing migrant workers, right to organize, right to association of the migrant workers, is a, a one strong um, um, instrument, I mean, our standard. So for the migrant workers, we should not forget their rights to protect. Okay. That's our job. Okay, very short, because some of our colleagues are ready with sneakers and everything just to go out and they, they will have to contribute something for the economy of Thailand. Okay, let me finish in two minutes. Uh, some of our colleagues uh, actually raised some question that uh, local employment yes of course our uh, soil our people our economy and uh, they will contribute to our economy by his contribution or her contribution but definitely this is the reality in a country like Bangladesh that we have our unemployment problem so 13 million people they are working outside still we have uh, oversupply for the for the for the workers we have very limited scopes for working 
in Bangladesh so that we have no option at this moment. So we have to create sort of employment opportunity outside the country. At the same time, we have to look for better and ethical, safe migration. We have no option. So definitely, this is one of the actually uh, reply. And uh, 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 information, definitely, as I have mentioned in, our, in my presentation, that uh, we have to have uh, exchange our, our, our sharing, our information, our data, everything, so that we can learn from each other. Uh, definitely uh, destination countries, uh, information, our local information, everything is, is needed for us. And uh, international labor standards and right to organize are uh, definitely all of these are basically uh, basically on the basis of international labor standards. We have our lot of you know documents, not only ILO standards, we have our GCM, Global Compact on Migration, we have our Abu Dhabi Dialogue, uh, Colombo Process, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that uh, on those basis, actually these rights are, uh, are actually ensured but we have to do something to make sure that all these rights are being implemented. We have to have, uh, uh, we have to do something for the betterness, for the better livelihood of our workers who are really working to contribute our economy by providing foreign currencies and foreign remittances. This is our duty. Thank you so much. Okay, so thank you very much.